Greetings, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome all participants. My name is Son Grenok Tang Jejit, member of International Collaboration Division of the National Science and Technology Development Agency, or NASDAQ, and also your MC today. It is my pleasure to welcome you here today. We appreciate your attention and participation to the President Forum, one of the highlight sessions of the NASDAQ Annual Conference since 2019. In this forum, four distinguished speakers will share and discuss their views under the theme of Transforming Research Institute to Support Sustainable and Resilient Societies in the 21st Century, and followed by an open stage discussion. For all participants, if you have questions or would like to share your point of view with our speakers, please leave your message in the Q&A chat box. Your questions will be shared with the speaker during Q&A after each presentation and, all in the, and also in the open discussion session. Before, before we start the forum, I would like to introduce Dr. Lily Uwilajit, NASDAQ Vice President for International Collaboration. Dr. Lily received her PhD from University of Kent, UK, specializing in molecular genetic in yeast. She also received several local and international awards in the field of biology and biotechnology. And Dr. Lily will be our moderator for the keynote session. Dr. Lily, the screen is yours. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Nat. So this year, NASDA Annual Conference, or NAC 2022, is held under the concept of revitalizing the Thai economy through BCG research and innovation. For those of you who might not be familiar with the BCG concept, please allow me to mention this concept very briefly. The biocircular green economy model, as the name suggested, is an integration of bioeconomy, circular economy, and green economy. The concept aims at creating self-reliance, build resilience, and expediting recovery from the pandemic. The model intends to utilize science, technology, and innovation to drive the national development focusing on conservation, rehabilitation, utilization, and management, as well as value creation of biological and cultural diversity. The model was introduced by the Thai government as a strategy for the national development and post-pandemic recovery and for achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. More importantly, the BCG is one of the focus topics of APEC 2022 or Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation hosted by Thailand this year. To complement the national agenda, the theme of this year President's Forum is transforming research institute to support sustainable and resilient society in the 21st century. So I believe our forum today will not only emphasize the importance of our network, but also significantly promote the BCG model in context of sustainable development. So before we start the forum, allow me to introduce you to Dr. Narong Siri Rodwarakun, president of NASDA. Apart from being NASDAQ president, Dr. Narong also holds numerous new, uh, important positions, such as an advisor to the subcommittee of the National Research, Science, and Innovation of Thailand Senate, corresponding member of the European Association of Research and Technology Organizations, or EATO, council member of Science and Technology in Society Forum, or SCS Forum, Japan, an advisory board member of the Global Young Academy, GYA, and importantly, member and secretariat of Thailand's National Biocircular Green Economy Policy Board. Now may I invite Dr. Narong Sirat Warakun to deliver the opening remarks. Thank you very much, Dr. Lili. Uh, dear Professor Dr. Yaping Chang, Professor Dr. Ulich Chua, Dato Dr. Mohammad Yusuf Sulaiman, Dr. Lakshmi Krishnan, District Guest, Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the National Science and Technology Development Agency, or NASDA, it is my honor and most privilege to welcome all of you to the President Forum, 
one of the highlights of Mazda Annual Conference 2022. I would like to express my appreciation to our keynote speakers for devoting their time to enlist this forum with their knowledge and experience relevant to the theme of the forum, which is transforming research institute to support sustainable and resilient societies in the 21st century. At present, our world is faced with multiple challenges, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, and environmental degradation. These global issues raise our concerns and require prompt response to cope with. It is significant to understand how the Research Institute can realize the transformations that will ensure that it can contribute to the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs and build resilient society. As for Thailand, the impact of climate change has increasingly caused natural disaster, which often affect vast areas and infinite demand that need to be addressed. Science, technology, and innovation, along with the bio-circular green economy models, are employed to enhance our ability to respond to the global phenomena and enable us to turn challenges and risk into opportunities. Accordingly to the country need to swiftly enhance knowledge and capacity to create new innovations and technologies to tackle climate change and other environmental concerns. And of course, at the same time, adapt and transition to sustainable and resilient future. Overall, it, it is believed that a transformation of research institute to support sustainable and resilient society will lead Thailand to the path to the UN Sustainable Development Goals through exchanging knowledge and technology between our local and international partners. As sustainability and uh, resilience are the common goal among all nations and calls for mutual endeavor, I hope this forum will facilitate collaboration among all of us to work towards global sustainability in the 21st century. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Narong, for your inspirational remarks. Now, let's start our session with the first speakers, Professor Ya Ping Chang, Vice President, Chinese Academy of Science, China. Before appointed Vice President of Chinese Academy of Science in 2012, Professor Zhang was the Director of State Key Laboratory of Genetic Resources and Evolution, Kunming Institute of Zoology. Professor Zhang also sits on editorial boards of several international periodicals, including Human Molecular Genetics and Frontier in Genetics. And today, we will hear his thoughts through the topics of enabling ecological civilization through the support from science and technology. Professor Zhang, if you're ready, the screen is yours. You have to you have your mic on, please. Uh, not yet. Oh, yes, that's good. Uh, dear Dr. Uh, Narong, dear Professor Francis, uh, dear Dr. Nini, dear colleagues and friends, greeting to you all. It's my uh, pleasure to uh, attend this session of present forum uh, 2022 on behalf of the Chinese Council of Sciences. I would like to extend our warmest and uh, sincere congratulations to NASA for the uh, 17th uh, annual conference. The world today is uh, undergoing major change, I think in a 
central, including the imbalance between human and nature. Uh, today, I would like to share some opinions and answers on the ecological uh, civilization from the perspective of science and technology. There will be uh, so many change, change municipalities themselves so clearly and intensely uh, uh, with the growth of uh, human population and uh, expansion of uh, uh, cities, uh, the speed of loss of the uh, habitats, native habitats and the forests uh, are increasing. Uh, uh, many uh, of the species uh, are threatened with extinction. Uh, this slide uh, illustrates uh, 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 the recent study on um, uh, some of the uh, on one of the well re, uh, well studied animal species amphibians. Well, this even for amphibians, uh, with the new uh, technology and uh, recent studies, many of the new species, particularly uh, crypto species, have been recognized, uh, both in China and in, uh, including in, in Thailand and in other Southeast Asian countries. Uh, this demonstrates that a large number of the species could go extinct, they even uh, have not been recognized. Uh, this uh, 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 slide uh, uh, shows that the uh, um, transformative change are needed to uh, bounce back better uh, to achieve SDG goal. Which is a challenge. Uh, Jonathan and I uh, 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 propose a very ambitious uh, a plan uh, to uh, encourage the government to set a minimum target of 30% of the oceans and, uh, uh, and land uh, uh, to be protected by 2030. And and uh, uh, this uh, uh, this idea has been uh, 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 extensively uh, discussed uh, 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 in uh, the last year's uh, 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 conference of parties, uh, COP15 of the Convention of Biological Diversity, uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this is a uh, 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 this very uh, ambitious plan, and uh, to achieve this, we need to integrate nature uh, conservation, climate change uh, mitigation, and uh, sustainable management of land and oceans in order to speed up the achievement of uh, SDGs. The development of the uh, cohesive science-based actions target is uh, paramount in addressing the major global uh, issues such as biodiversity loss and uh, climate change. Uh, indeed, as uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping recently mentioned, we need to uh, take up our no, uh, no responsibility for the entire uh, human civilization, and uh, we need to respect the nature, follow its law, and uh, uh, protect it. 
we need to find a way for man and the nature to live in harmony, balance, and uh, coordinate the economical development and the ecological protection, and work together to build a, a prosperous, clean, and beautiful world. Ecological uh, civilization was first coined in China in the 1980s as an academic concept and widely used in scientific publications since the uh, 2000. This idea had a strong appeal in China as it was consistent with ancient uh, Chinese thought philosophy. In response to rapid growth of China's economy, uh, the government increasingly uh, focused on addressing environment challenges. Thus, ecological civilization was uh, proposed as an uh, innovative way to coincide, to reconcile uh, economical development and uh, environmental protection in 2007. Since 2012, President Xi Jinping has consistently uh, championed its adoption and uh, uh, mutual reaching, describing it as a sport for sustaining the development of the Chinese nation. As an international, uh, international name, we are established scientific research institution uh, hosting multiple disciplines. Uh, CAS remains committed to uh, providing some science and a strong technological uh, support to uh, achieving ecological civilization construction. Uh, our uh, research and uh, uh, research now aligns to five uh, engines to help us achieve transformative change and uh, uh, maximize a positive impact. The first engine is to uh, enhance resilience to risk. Has has uh, carried out a number of programs addressing the biodiversity issues. Uh, in fact, mainstreaming the biodiversity conservation is embraced throughout all level of science research programs we implement. For instance, uh, scientists. Uh, have made great achievement uh, in studying threatened uh, flora and fauna and uh, distributing and uh, uh, conservation status of China biodiversity. At the center of our goals, we have succeeded, uh, we have uh, assisted and uh, placed uh, natural, ecological, and uh, geological areas as priority uh, protected area. Also, CAS uh, have taken the lead of uh, assessing uh, e ecosystem service and uh, comply uh, reports on China's first national ecosystem assessment, the report qualified and uh, help management change in ecosystem service, including food production, carbon sequestration, and the soil and the soil retention, sandstorm uh, prevention, 
provision of habitat for biodiversity. Continuing by briefing on cast uh, specific actions, we conducted a comprehensive evaluation of three plantations of the three nodes project in the past 40 years. Three nodes means Northwest, Northeast, and the North, North China. Using remote sensor data, ecosystem uh, positioning stations, meteorological stations, sampling uh, uh, statistic, field research and uh, other means. We output a 40 year comprehensive evaluation report, which was officially released at the new office of the State Council website. Since the end of the uh, uh, 1970s, China has uh, implemented six national key ecological restoration projects. The results show that key ecological uh, projects implemented in China have significantly improved the carbon storage and the uh, carbon sink functions and play a huge carbon sequestration effect. Biodiversity uh, uh, and uh, its conservation can therefore contribute to the mitigation of uh, climate change and are important part of the nature-based uh, solutions. Another action is to uh, document biodiversity. Since the uh, 1950s, CAS has organized 850 universities uh, college and research institution to uh, carry out more than 40 comprehensive scientific uh, expeditions on natural uh, resource with the aim of mapping the country's biodiversity resource. As shown in this slide, China's red list of biodiversity higher plans was published in 2013, vertebrate in 2015, and uh, macro uh, uh, fungi in 2018. Since the 1980s, we have been aware of the need to present the current distribution of the, uh, vegetation types in the better way. In 2020, CAS scientists output the China vegetation map, which show that 3.3 million uh, meter squares of vegetated areas of China have changed during the past three decades due to human activities and uh, economic change. We hope this map can uh, help understand and uh, manage China's uh, terrestrial ecosystem and also aim vegetation restoration and uh, biodiversity conservation. Focusing uh, closely on major strategies such as the sustainable uh, development of uh, Tibetan plateau, has, has made significant efforts in the areas of 
change and the impact of uh, uh, Asian water power, which provide important scientific support for the national water conservation strategy. The fourth action is research on biodiversity. Has has set up projects on biodiversity research, developed database and uh, information platform, and uh, improve and improved technologies and uh, stand standards for survey, observation and. Uh, assessments to provide strong technical and uh, talent support for novel scientific discoveries, uh, ranging from a range and evolution of biodiversity, uh, maintaining uh, mechanisms of biodiversity to biodiversity conservation and uh, ecosystem surveys. Moreover, CAS has partner place monitoring and uh, observation uh, networks for various ecosystems and species. Those networks have played an important role in supporting biodiversity research, demonstrating uh, and uh, promoting relevant technology and uh, protecting species and uh, their habitat. Among them, the Chinese Ecosystem Research uh, Network, CERN, and uh, the China Biodiversity Monitoring and Research Network, CINAPOM, C4BEL. On, only site few have been developed. The Southwest China uh, Wildlife Gym Plasma uh, Repository uh, built by CAS is the only conservation large scientific facility focusing on the preservation of wildlife gym plasma resource in China as the largest wildlife gem plasma uh, repositories in Asia, the gem plasma bank has become a global leader in biodiversity conservation together with the uh, Billingham Seed Bank in the UK and and the uh, so for Global Seed Bank in Norway. In 2016, CAS developed the anti poaching equipment and uh, integrates application system to combat illegal trade in wildlife uh, uh, plants, especially. Uh, uh, the poaching of endangered species such as uh, elephants and the rhinos on the African continent. Has set up an international research center of big data for sustainable development goals to facilitate the implementations of the UK UN. Uh, 2030 agenda for utilizing big data, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, space technologies, and uh, network uh, communication technologies. Plus, we will, as always, stand guard for our harmonious and uh, beautiful plant for all life and uh, contribute to its well-being with action. Looking to the future, 
with the support of uh, connecting state uh, uh, infrastructures and uh, scientists, we will continue to protect the natural ecosystem, restore eco environmental service, provide more support for healthy nature and eco civilization to achieve sustainable and uh, resilient societies and uh, meet people's growing demand for a beautiful eco environment. More importantly, we would like to work together with uh, uh, international communities as well uh, as all of your present today to realize the uh, worldwide uh, bridging of uh, harmonious coexistence between human and nature. Thank you for your attention. For your interesting talk. We have learned from your talk that CAS has taken a very serious step to support ecological civilization through STI and set up several action plans to achieve the goals, including the ecological restoration, biodiversity research, and development of biodiversity database. This is also in line with Thailand bio-circular and green economy in promoting the biological and cultural diversity database and plus platforms to be the fundamental of the sustainable development of economy and society. So we are very certain that we could learn more from Chinese Academy of Science, and there will definitely be several opportunities that we could collaborate in this area. So we will leave that for discussion later on. So thank you again, Professor Zhang, for your inspiration talk. Um, now for our Second speaker, I would like to introduce you to Professor Uri Shur, Director of Institute for Bio and Geoscience 2, Plant Science, IBG2, Fortune Centrum, Jewish, Germany. Professor Shur's scientific expertise is in the field of plant physiology, plant phenotyping, including technology development and quantitative image analysis. He extended this in the last decade to integrated bioeconomy and has established since significant activities in biorefinery research, digital bioeconomy, socioeconomic research, and strategic concepts towards sustainable bioeconomy. He has also held several important positions, including the vice president of the European Plant Science Organization and a member of the International Advisory Council for Global Bioeconomy. And it is our privilege to hear his thought under the topic of sorry, regionalization of bioeconomy, the path of sustainable economies and stewardship to natural resources. That is really a new concept that we look forward to hear from you, Professor Shur. Are you ready? Yes, I'm okay. ready. I, uh, oh. You turn off your camera by chance. Okay, now you're here again. So if you're I ready, the screen is yours. Can you see the slides? Yes. Good. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, and to all your excellencies in the, um, in the, um, and for the opportunity to, to give this presentation today, I'm talking about regionalization of bioeconomy. Essentially, what we are facing is, uh, as we have already heard before, the um, transformation of um, of our globe, of our activities globally as a, as mankind into sustainable opportunities. And what we are trying here uh, in the in the in, in our specific work here in, in research and implementation is to use the idea of the bioeconomy to transform. Um, towards sustainable bioeconomies um, and uh, the regionalization is a very important pathway to transform regions to sustainable bioeconomies and thereby generating impact from science to regions and I will give you some examples and but before that let me just so shortly start by uh, our definition our link um, as as you've already seen before you probably will see uh, further 
sustainable development goals are the kind of um, overarching um, uh, framework to which we are uh, relating here in the context of sustainable development, obviously. And a sustainable bioeconomy has many links to all the 17 SDGs. Um, and you can probably uh, see from the slide here that, for example, the first one is about increasing primary production, the quality of biomass and health issues with diets, for example, that's improving primary production utilization. A second part is more efficient secondary use of and conversion of biomass, including bioenergy, in, but also energy beyond the bioenergy, valuable materials and chemicals, and renewable resources for our industries. So on the next level, and we have heard a very nice talk just now about the importance of biodiversity and maintaining stewardship to, to natural resources. Here we see the sustainability and ecological targets from biodiversity, sustainability, water, nutrients, land use, and climate change. And last but not least, the entire transformation pathways pathway also needs to include societal innovation, which we need to take into focus from into education, the question of incomers, income, smallholder farmers, for example, but also gender equality. All of them are uh, elements which we need to take, consider in order to look into sustainable bioeconomy. The concept itself has been has a long tradition, many times driven from science, but uh, more and more taken over from industry and from uh, from society. And what we see there is that we not only have to look at these four different domains, but we really have to integrate them because they are not independent from each other. They need to be integrated in a way. And we see a very good opportunity here to do systematic integration in, in specific regions. And I'll tell you in a minute how this actually works. So we have the overarching goals of sustainable development goals. And if we want to implement them, they are very much dependent on regions. Why on regions? First, within regions, natural resources are pretty diverse. If you have forest, if you have agriculture, if you have tundra, if you have tropical or, or northern hemisphere, you have different natural resources. Science and education has a different uh, has, a, has many roles in developing regions. There are quite, quite diverse um, setups of regions with respect to science and education. Markets are often uh, regional, but they are also the link to global markets and trade. And this is also very distinct between different regions. Human resources in the different regions are very different and we need to, in order to implement, we need to consider what the human resources are, how we can most uh, efficiently use them in order to make to build sustainable uh, societies and sustainable economies. And the thing which is often neglected is the legal framework, which is obviously not only legal, but also the political framework, which is guiding uh, regions and societies in certain directions. If you look at the actors, which are very important, in all the regions, we have actors in science, in economy, the regions itself, so regional authorities, uh, communities, uh, the media, it's very important, but also the public and the civil society. And all of them contribute to a regional development. And if we want to establish uh, bioeconomy in a certain region, we need to be aware that bioeconomy will only be taken up if it's affecting in solving a concrete problem. So start from the problem and so try to solve it by a bioeconomy solution. It needs to be affordable technologically, economically, and social. And it very much depends on the initial situation and the general conditions, which I shortly outlined up here, but um, to, uh, this is just a kind of framework which you can see, which we are working on quite intensively at the moment in concrete aspects as well. So what is the idea of the circular bioeconomy? The circular bioeconomy is addressing a circular approach with respect to a circular economy approach with respect to bioeconomy. So including agriculture and silviculture, including the food and the raw materials for industry, including residues, the conversion of material into products, thereby doing waste to raw materials and bringing this back. There's a lot of technology in there, but there's also a lot of social innovation included, which is also looking at the consumption and how people appreciate the, uh, the value of material, the value of products, and the value of the entire uh, community. It also has very strong links, and that should not be forgotten to major drivers uh, of our day-to-day our technology and uh, society. This is on the one hand, digitalization. We, will have, we have a lot of 
interactions with digital uh, technologies. I'll come to that in a minute. And we also have a lot of interaction with the energy sector, not only with respect to bioenergy, but also a lot of the uh, bioeconomy background is energy intensive uh, industry, like um, including um, um, food industry or uh, textiles or paper, for example. So this is the setup which we have from there. And I will give you one example where these regions in change, specifically in our case, coal phase out regions are hot are hotspot example. And there's a good reason why we focus on this at the moment. Germany has decided to step out of coal uh, by 2020, 2035. The new government actually wants to do this earlier by 2030. And uh, this means for the three regions which we have in Germany, which are doing coal mining, that we have to that we have a very strong structural change happening in the region, and specifically for our region, and see a map down here uh, of our region where we live, where we are in the Forschungszentrum Center ourselves. This this uh, will cost something between 9,000 jobs directly in the coal industry, including the power stations, and close to 100 uh, together with the associated industries, close to 100,000 jobs which are affected by this and 1.4 billion euros per year, which is the income which is lost from that region. So it's a real economic problem. So why are we doing that? We are uh, not, on the one hand, we are obviously interested from the scientific perspective. On the other hand, we are sitting in the middle of this region. This is the research center here in Jülich. We are working on energy information bioeconomy. We are roughly 6,800 people working here, but we are in the middle of this region and therefore we also have a responsibility to act on that. And this is the, the coal mines around us. This is how they're looking like. This is also the big uh, power stations, which are some of the most point, uh, most intensive point clouds of CO2 uh, in Europe and globally, uh, which uh, will disappear within the next few years. So what is the target? The target is to that the, the economy, the, the region started to build on strong industry innovation technologies and topics in the region. This is on the one hand the energy issues, which will which will move into renewable energy, but this is also very strongly the resource and agribusiness uh, resources and agribusiness part, energy intensive industries, which I already mentioned shortly before. But we will also look into the development of the landscape in itself, uh, including the ecological aspects, infrastructure, mobility, and innovation and training. And if you look at this from a bioeconomy perspective. What we do is we are building a bioeconomy model region for sustainable management and living, which includes all the different areas and have where we have links to all of them. What does this mean? We want to change from this fossil based region into a bio based economy. And this means we have to replace fossil resources. We have to innovate on food and feed and we have to build a real circular economy, which is the basis of sustainability. And we have to, at the same time, look into the economy producing new products, new processes, and new services using existing strengths and building on them and developing new key technologies. And this is really looking at a full entire regional approach. So we build a model region for bioeconomy, which we call bioeconomy idea, which is on climate protection and building on sustainable development uh, economy and living. How do we do this? We have done first a kind of mapping, what kind of regional economy our bioeconomy landscape is there with respect to ecology, with respect to economy, with respect to society. And this will now be transformed by our project and by the alignment with an economy and structural program in the region towards an integrated bioeconomy region in the range from 2020 now to 2038 which is uh, much more intensified and, and overcomes a lot of the um, issues which we have developed in the last years through the, the fossil-based uh, economy and society. What does this mean? We are building on strength. We are building on favorable condi conditions and resources for agriculture. We have a very strong industry. If you look at this from, a, from the basis of a more history background, all of these industries have a very good bioeconomy background. It's food industry. It's paper industry, it's chemical industry, also uh, renewable energies and textile industry have a strong background in bioeconomy. We provide jobs at high and low qualification, very important for, for a, a sustainable development of the region. There's a high activation of the society uh, towards sustainability. And we have a very strong basis in science and training uh, in the region uh, for bioeconomy. 
And we have uh, built two major uh, projects on that in the past already. We have built the Bioeconomy Science Center, which now has a, a 11 years history or to be a competence center for integrated bioeconomy, bringing together regional and global aspects, a focus on science, which now we use the Rhinus of Sevilla, so this is our co-region as a living lab in order to look how the bioeconomy science can be implemented. And we then have formed a second project, the Bioeconomy Revier project, which is specifically focusing on structural change. It's dominantly here in the region, but also tries as a model region to then transfer these, uh, these opportunities uh, into other regions. We are also building this on a European uh, perspective with the Just Transition Platform for all the 53 other coal regions in, in Europe, which are uh, facing the same kind of change. And it's far going, it's going far beyond science. It's going into civil society, into business, um, and into um, obviously including a scientific approach. Often this we use it as a living lab opportunity. Often we have transformations driven by innovation, uh, which is uh, one possibility to have a kind of technology push where technology objectives go towards an unknown demand or a market pull. In this specific case, there's a policy driven change. Uh, we want to uh, have a sustainable society. We want to achieve the Paris goals and therefore the polit politics decided to step out of uh, coal. And therefore we have to look how transformation pathways actually work in this, in such a kind of region. So what did we de do We did initially, we had the initial phase where we just, uh, uh, we, we looked at a coordination of regional transformation where we involved many different stakeholders, uh, including citizens, uh, um, local um, um, uh, economy, politicians, uh, farming, obviously, and scientists. It, we took a cross-sectoral approach in networking and integration. It generated a startup ecosystem and the science to business uh, uh, region, local and regional bioeconomy profiles, even for communities, uh, for individual towns were, were developed. And we had a knowledge, we have a knowledge transfer and society participation process and developed out of this a future perspective of the entire region and also form a new regional identity, which is linked to the bioeconomy approach. Um, the types of projects which we specifically Im implemented uh, were so-called innovation labs. And these innovation labs are 90, 15 of them, uh, actually also expanding at 19 at the moment, and they have major targets by combining expertise and capabilities across, on the one hand, research organizations, but also linking them into practical topics and forming a dialogue with industry and society. There are four different types. One is on qualification projects where there is already a deer and we develop it towards a, project, a product. There are innovation platforms and interface labs, which are physical spaces where industry and academia can meet. And there are also novel concepts where entire regional concepts are developed uh, for bioeconomy, a file, a, a file affiliated with innovation management. And I'll give you some examples on how this is, will work. We have clustered them in four, four, major, four major targets. Sustainable innovative agriculture with digitalization and automation, renewable raw materials, bio-based materials and resource efficiency, as well as biorefineries, uh, coupling bioeconomy with renewable energies, and obviously also sustainable land use and ecological aspects. We bundle them in three major uh, blocks, innovative agriculture, integrated biorefinery and biotechnology and plastics not meaning that they are isolated, but they are tightly interacting. And I'll just give you a very short overview of what kind of topics we are working in there. In the context of innovative agriculture, we are having a brain energy lab, which is about agriculture robotics and digital agriculture, where we are working together with uh, companies as well as with farmers and identifying what kind of opportunities are there with agricultural robotics. We are forming a DGR, a digital geo-information system, which is not only for agriculture, but widely used for the planning of regions. Circular Fruto Valley is an, uh, it generates an integrated value chains for herbal medical uh, and medical plants, uh, also in the context of farmers together with, with industry. The Agro Innovation Lab uses a very uh, unusual situation, which we have with the mining sites where we can form a field lab to, to develop resource efficient crops um, in, a, in a very specified uh, opportunity for, uh, for plant breeding. 
Another very important topic in the region is to combine agri-food energy context. And this is an um, activity which we are building very strongly on where we have combining photovoltaics uh, in, the, in the region with production below these photovoltaics in order to collect water, generate um, uh, electricity, and also use uh, the, uh, the, uh, the same space for production of food. In algae fertilizer box, we are using algae for food, feed, materials, and chemicals. So this is another kind of activity linked to the agro-food energy part. The second cluster is about integrated biorefineries. As you know, uh, biorefineries are uh, very important opportunities to make value out of biomass. This is on the one hand about using ups, ups, upcycling regional organic residues. As we said, we had a lot of regional, um, uh, for example, food industry, which has organic residues, uh, which you can reuse and upcycle in biorefineries, but also separation technologies, which are needed or entire modular biorefinery concepts where we are distributing biorefineries in, biorefineries in space to get closer to the distributed biomass, uh, which we uh, build on, or gas fermentation as another opportunity to generate value out of um, a biomass, uh, which has been transformed to methane before. Biotechnology and plastics uh, technology is also very important uh, for the development here. We first, this is a more classical approach by digitalization of microbial strain and bioprocess development. But we also have one project which is focusing on microplastics, food and feed systems, uh, including um, novel opportunities to, for bioplastics, or a production platform for biopharmaceutica, which is also linking into the uh, pharmaceutical industry in the region, or a project which is looking into tailor-made protein products, which can be used for uh, uh, sustainable um, uh, crop protection, for example, uh, in, in a very um, ingenious way. These different innovation labs are then bundled into integrated value chains because it's not only about scientists, it's about the entire uh, um, um, stakeholder groups from science to economy, the regional approach, the media and the public. And this is some of the uh, value chains which we have here, the agro-food energy system I already mentioned shortly, agroforestry systems, medical and herbal value chains, sustainable packaging, as well as construction beyond wood. Um, building houses uh, by other ways, novel paper industry, upcycling food waste, bioplastics, as well as bioeconomy at home, which is bringing bioeconomy back to the uh, to the citizens themselves. We are not only staying behind the um, um, the scene behind in, in, the, in our forest, for, uh, in our research institutes, but we are going uh, specifically and actively addressing profile sites in the region, profile sites which make bioeconomy innovation visible to um, industry, to the stakeholders, but also the public. This includes obviously an openness of the science, in, uh, science um, um, communities, but also developing industrial parks um, for, for example, biotech meets food or a sustainability forum or innovative agriculture or textile. And we also go into a model factory for novel, make, novel paper making, a fiber center, and bioeconomy and construction purposes. Altogether, what we are trying to do is we link uh, basic research, which asks what, uh, what kind of, what is the chance to have really very essential new things, which we still continue, with research on systems, which uh, asks the question, how would the ideal system actually look like? So this would be the invention scale and bridging it to a really implementation by and towards innovation by research solving specific problems in the region as a kind of opportunity. And this is what we do specifically in the region, but I want to just mention that this also goes beyond our the, the region. It's a kind of idea which we, which we are spreading out to um, many more activities. So the European Green Deal holds a lot of these activities. We also have consortium on the European level, bio-based industry, for example, and it's also increasingly taken up by, by the, by the um, financial sector, uh, which we are mobilizing at the moment uh, uh, with, uh, with funds, which we get directly from private investment uh, in order to implement bioeconomy. Also in regions and along the lines, which I explained before. So I hope that I could give you a little bit of an idea that regionalization of bioeconomy is an opportunity where we can generate a path to sustainable economies, 
and at the same time do stewardship to natural resources. Thanks very much for your attention. That was very, I find the concept is very fascinating and actually very logical. And I think it is also true for any other regions, including ASEAN. As you may aware that Thailand has initiated the ASEAN BCG network to regionalize the bio-circular and green economy concept in ASEAN. So we believe that the network will be a great platform to drive the UN SDG in the region. However, I'm sure that it can also collaborate with other international networks, including Global Bioeconomy Network and uh, Julish as well, and have some of useful trans, uh, technology transfer and localization in ASEAN. So thank you again, Professor Shaw, for sharing this with us. And we are looking forward to discussing with you and other distinguished speakers later on. So next speakers, Datu. Um, Dr. Mohd Yusof bin Sulaiman, President and CEO of Malaysian Industry uh, Government for High Technology or MIT, a public-private partnership organization for the advancement of technology and industrial development. And apart from that, Dr. Yusof also holds numerous important positions such as a fellow of the ASEAN Academy of Engineering and Technology, Academy of Science Malaysia, and the Charter Institute of Logistics and Transport. Cal uh, tra yeah, Transport. Council member of the Science and Technology for Society Forum, SDS, and UNESCO Isfahan Regional Center for Technology Incubator and Science Park Development, and a board member of the Kulim High Technology Park Melaka Green Technology Corporation and Aerospace Malaysia Innovation Center. And today, Dr. Yusuf will give a talk on transformation model for innovative, resilient, and sustainable future. So, Dr. Yusuf, hello. Thank you. Are you Thank ready? you, Dr. Lily. Can you hear me? Yes. Dr. Lily, can you hear me? You yes. Very clear. Very nice to have you, you here Thank with you. us. So now the stage is yours, Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Dr. Lili, for that very kind uh, introduction. And uh, firstly, let me thank uh, and congratulate NSTDA for organizing this uh, President's uh, Forum. And also like to say uh, uh, hello to Dr. Narong and the NSTDA team. Hopefully to meet you soon uh, in the in the near future. So um, Basically, uh, when we talk about transformation, uh, I'd just like to go back uh, 30 years ago when a country like Malaysia were, were going through its hey, industry me, economic transformation. Yourself. Excuse me. Yes? Um, can you make the slide uh, in the full screen mode, please? Okay. Full screen mode. Would you like us to share the Hopefully. slide for you? Or are you okay with that? Oh. Okay, uh, no, we will do that. We will do that. Uh, you're solving the thing here. Is that okay? Mm, no? not, yet. not yet. Not yet? No. Okay. All right. Oh. Uh, well, Is that okay now? It's, it's not in the full screen, but uh, if you can click at the, no, oh. this is not, this is a, a presenter's display. Okay, a few seconds, Dr. Lili. That's fine. Okay. Yes, this is it. Thank you. That's that's okay now. Yes. <laughs> thank, you, thank you. Thank you. So, so, sorry, sorry, everyone, for the uh, slight uh, technical uh, issue. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much again. And uh, I just want to repeat what I just said uh, a few seconds ago. That uh, when you talk about transformation model, uh, this is a very important uh, uh, thing to to go through when you have a need, especially in terms of uh, economic, industry, or social uh, changes. 
that's happening around us. So in the case of Malaysia, about 30 years ago, uh, we would like to transform from an agriculture economic base to an industrial based uh, economy. And that was uh, in 1993 that my organization, Mike, was formed to really support, facilitate, enable this transformation from the agri economy to the industrial based uh, economy. So it's, it's a very important, I think, measure to consider every aspect, not just in terms of the uh, institution or the structure, but to look at other elements as well. So that's why my next slide is actually trying to talk a little bit about my organization, MIT, which has been, uh, I think, played an important role in uh, making the debt changes for Malaysia to go through to become an industrialized manufacturing base and a scientific based uh, economy. Next slide, please. So, who we are, basically, uh, we at that time in 1993, you have various stakeholders that are very keen and very encouraged to participate in that economic uh, transformation. But rarely, uh, I think, we see that uh, issues with regard to uh, having the same aspiration, having the same uh, you know, uh, wavelength in terms of communication, and therefore there need to be some kind of a platform, some kind of a uh, broker to, to create that kind of conversation between the various stakeholders, especially between the government and the industry. So this is very important because we, 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 at first we need to build the trust between the two uh, stakeholders so that they will be able to uh, share and also to be working together throughout that particular uh, objective. Secondly is that uh, we need a lot of uh, information. We, we, we need to create uh, uh, industry intelligence. We need to look at what kind of scenario that Malaysia is going to face. So we did a lot of technology foresight, road mapping for our different technologies, do a lot of policy intervention to, to ensure that whatever we actually push through uh, can actually be, be done. So there's a lot of uh, you know, learning experience from that, from many countries, from whatever best practices that we can learn to, to, to make that transformation a reality. And then thirdly is that, is that uh, we need to be very uh, clear in terms of our vision, in terms of our, so that we can actually decide to invest in certain areas of high technology uh, to make sure that we have the, the right skill set we have the right institution, structure, and et cetera, to make sure that this transformation actually happen, not on just a short-term basis, but on a long-term uh, sustainable uh, basis. Next slide, a little bit more, again, about my uh, organization, MIT. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, our uh, strategic role, uh, one is that to provide that strategic advisory to government and industry, not saying that we are having all the intelligence, but this is by working together in terms of our planning, uh, involving all the stakeholders, the, the industry, the government, the universities, the NGOs, to think about how we can move forward a certain uh, industry uh, area of focus or to, to look at the technology development per se. So this, this, this is very important, that we need to have the credible inputs and uh, uh, suggestion and wisdom from all the stakeholders. And then when we, when we move a little bit on, then people say, you know, you, you just create all these uh, strategic plans, but you need to actually put money where your mouth is. So in transformation, you need to show people where their opportunities are and some can show, of them, show to them some uh, 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 evidence that by nurturing or investing in this technology, they will be able to create businesses or to make some kind of economic gains. So we put uh, the money up front, invest in certain technology, and then the, then the private sector, the other players follow through. This is very true for especially high technology areas. And then, of course, you need to create a, a constant uh, a communication channel for people to keep on having that conversation, having that kind of exchange, and therefore we create a lot of uh, hubs and also clusters to, to make this, this happen. So in terms of uh, area of focus, I think uh, in, in, recent, in recent years, of course, uh, 
the fourth industrial revolution becomes a very important consideration uh, to, to especially for technology uh, development and to look at what kind of uh, businesses will be emerging as opportunities in the future. We also focus on mobility because most of the, the elements in terms of technology development actually focus on movement of uh, uh, goods and also data and, and, and people. So this will allow a lot of things to be uh, happening in that particular economy. Foresight is the one of the key areas that we do in order to establish the scenario for every uh, technology, every industrial sector, so that we are able to position Malaysia and our companies in a very competitive manner. And finally, as uh, the two speakers have uh, alluded to, is sustainable development goals need to be incorporated into the current business model, into current economic activities, and therefore we have to, to put the, the sustainable element into all activities in, in, in the country. So basically, this is what might has done one as a transformation platform for the country to move from agri to the industrial base or even to the innovation based economy. And then also might is that, that uh, platform to create the, 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 the partnership model, partnership uh, uh, activities among the various uh, stakeholders. So that's one that came from our transformation. Next slide. Of course, uh, uh, we look at the, 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 the things that's happening around us in, in the world. And I think this has been the, uh, a great uh, uh, key uh, elements uh, to describe how the world is changing so fast. Uh, the world has become very volatile. I mean, it's not like way back in uh, 30 or 40 years ago, the speed and uh, the, the, of, of change uh, is, is really very, very, very fast. So we need to be on our toes often to make sure that we are not left behind in, those, in, in many of the areas that we, we, we're looking at. Second, the U stands for uncertainty because things are becoming less predictable. I mean, before it was mentioned about climate change and I think even in terms of the economic uh, uh, activities, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty that is created by so many uh, factors. Uh, fuel price, for example, has gone up. That actually creates a lot of issues for many of the industries that actually based on, on fossil fuel. Next is complexity in terms of systemic uh, independencies. We saw during the pandemic, many of the supply chains were affected. Uh, even though you are uh, across the world in terms of your activity, your business, it will still impact you in some way or another. So it's, it's quite a, 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 you know, a, a close-knit uh, supply chain, uh, value chain that we're talking about nowadays that can easily be disrupted. Next is ambiguity. I think in terms of that, uh, we have a multitude of uh, options to realize our, our end objective, and therefore we have to be more careful in terms of our, our selection. So that is the world that we are living in, and especially for the younger generations, uh, these are the things that you have to deal with. Things are changing by the seconds, and therefore you have to have policy response. You have to have uh, uh, strategies that actually be, be adaptable enough, agile enough to, to cater for these uh, changes. Next slide, please. So in that sense, uh, I think uh, we can look at some of these key elements when we look at ecosystems for research and et cetera. The, the, the challenges that we are facing is, uh, are, can, be, can be grouped into technological uh, progress. I think especially in the digitalization that was mentioned before, this has created a lot of disruption, a lot of uh, new uh, demands by the society and also by the business uh, community. Increasing demand of natural resources, of course, is uh, uh, finite uh, uh, resources that we need to now balance between its uh, uses and therefore look for alternative uh, 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 materials and et cetera to actually uh, uh, support our manufacturing uh, activities. Globalization and economic liberalization are factors that is uh, really creating that kind of competition. Uh, we need to you know, raise up our level of uh, competitiveness in order for us to survive in terms of the business. 
climate change, of course, create a lot of uh, fact, uh, you know, impact. Uh, it was mentioned before by, by Dr. Narong in terms of uh, natural disasters and etc. that we now have to face, uh, live with. Uh, Professor Yusuf, uh, we lost you. We lost your voice. Can you? Um, can you have your mic? Is it on still? Uh, can you? No, we don't hear you. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Can you, be, can you say something? Oh, okay. We don't hear you yet. There's a problem. Um, uh, oh, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can oh, hear you now. Sorry. All right. Sorry for Thank that. You. Yes, please continue. Right. Um, so I was summing you up. Still have, the... You still have time. Don't worry. Um, okay. Yes. <laughs> and uh, right. can we have the slide back? Yes. Thank you so much. Right. Please continue. So I, I was uh, a bit uh, concluding about these uh, new challenges that we are facing, whether we are research institutions, whether we are policy uh, bodies, whether we are businesses. These are some of the challenges that we are facing. It's here to stay. Uh, I was about to talk about the rural urban uh, uh, tran transitions. Uh, we know that many of the population will be moving into urban areas. Uh, we are looking into uh, making that uh, 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 comfortable for people in terms of our smart cities uh, uh, agenda. And uh, we look also into issues like waste uh, management. Uh, so these are the things that we have to deal with when we look at these uh, challenges. And finally, about the rap rapid uh, de demographic uh, change in, in, each, in each country. So these are real challenges that was there before the pandemic, but make into more rapid and more critical, uh, not to say post-pandemic, but coming out of the pandemic, we will be facing all these uh, challenges. So next slide, please. So I think in a way, when, when we look at the uh, research uh, ecosystem, I think uh, we, we need to look at how we can bring all the stakeholders uh, together. And uh, I think we need to be very uh, uh, synergistic in terms of how we use the resources, how do we leverage on the institutions, uh, and, and et cetera. And I think this is very important that, that we actually created what we call the Malaysia Advanced Technology Cluster and Hub. So from the earlier speaker, uh, Professor Ulrich, I think it can be looked at from a regional basis. It can be looked at the national uh, uh, basis. Uh, sectoral scanning is, is, is very important uh, to, to look and assess the demand and opportunities. Uh, and uh, of course, the, to look at the technology and innovation based on the locality, based on the, on the availability of resources at that particular uh, location. Uh, strategic facilitation is very important to allow for communication, conversation happening between uh, clusters and, and hub. Uh, important to identify partners and uh, alliances, uh, good uh, companies, uh, good institutions, they can actually uh, support uh, each other and the whole ecosystem uh, development, infrastructure, uh, skill, uh, people, and extra is very, very uh, critical. Virtual linkages, because we are not talking only about physical uh, embodiment of the uh, cluster and the hub, but also how we can actually uh, use a digitalization to make it uh, very efficient. And of course, all these need to be uh, measured in terms of its performance uh, from, from time to time. So what we are look, looking at when we look at transformation model, I think a uh, 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 model like this actually will enhance a lot of the uh, locally, locally, local strength and what we do uh, best in fragments, 
and make it into a very total and wholesome uh, uh, impact uh, at, at the end. Next slide. So I guess uh, what would be the five uh, future defining uh, attributes uh, I think that will guide transformation not only of research institute but also research uh, ecosystem. One is uh, of course uh, innovation, but innovation must be uh, uh, targeted, must be very precise, and in a way it's a mission-oriented uh, innovation policy is very, very key to actually trans transform uh, uh, research and development into uh, economic activities and into public good and into uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, major uh, impact to the whole, to the whole uh, country. Next is uh, partnership, which I think uh, is very, very critical. I'm sure that everybody agree that no one institution or no one country can actually solve a lot of these global uh, challenges. Uh, we need to partner up, especially in a, in a, in a small country like Mal Malaysia. We, 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 we actually ex uh, expounded, promote uh, not only formal partnership, but also informal uh, partnership. Third is sustainability but not only looking at the, econ uh, the environmental uh, uh, element, but you also have to talk about longevity of uh, programs and also the financial sustenance of uh, projects or programs that we, we start. And I think this is one of the things that uh, I learned from NSTDA, uh, continuous uh, 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 investment into testing and industrial research activities have made NSTDA a very prominent organization in that area. That is something that we would like to, to study more and more. Uh, fourth is in resilience. Of course, uh, we, we need to build that kind of uh, uh, agility and adaptability. Uh, we can only do that if we know what's in store in the future. So in MITE, we do a lot of foresighting and future scanning uh, or future studies uh, here to advise the government and the industry. And finally, the in inclusiveness. Uh, we talk about the 360 degrees model. We like programs that we do on the ground. For example, when we do our biomass to a biodegradable packaging product, it not only creates new businesses, but also provide the farmers with a different uh, uh, complementary or supplementary income by, by, pro by supplying the rice stems or rice husks to the business uh, people. Uh, and, and therefore create a kind of circular uh, 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 economy uh, when they used to burn these uh, stems and husks after their harvesting uh, period. So inclusiveness is very important when you think about business or programs or projects that it must touch so many stakeholders, whether it's the citizens, whether it's the universities, whether it's the NGOs, whether it's the government or private sector. So it, it has to be thought in a, in a wholesome process. So I, I think this is a very important uh, uh, pillars of uh, transformation and, and building a, a rich e a research ecosystem or even other, other uh, setups. Next slide, please. And uh, when we move forward, I think it, we have to design that future and, and not leave it to, to chance. So in, in, in many situations, uh, things are becoming so rapidly changed so many uh, complexity, we, we somehow, you know, uh, uh, leave it to chance to make uh, some of the program projects uh, successful. So I think in, in designing this uh, uh, future, designing the whole ecosystem uh, framework, uh, uh, we actually uh, look into what we call the first methodology. Uh, we have to look at the funding and financial uh, 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 mount that we can actually put into these uh, uh, changes. Uh, funding not only from the government, but also from private sector or even from multilateral organizations overseas. So we have to be able to identify that uh, funding uh, uh, pool, but we also have to introduce incentives and others to get people into the research uh, ecosystem. Uh, second is the word I, infrastructure. I think we have to look at the uh, ability of uh, infrastructure that is not only accessible for researchers, but also for SMEs, uh, startups, and extra would be able to, to benefit from this infrastructure. And, and I mentioned earlier that infrastructure is not just the hard infrastructure, but also the uh, soft uh, infrastructure. Third is the word R, regulation and policies. I think must be uh, able to uh, motivate 
to uh, uh, champion this uh, transformation uh, and make it easy for things to, to happen. So we sometimes deal with a, a very uh, uh, rigid and very uh, complex uh, policies uh, in the past. So we now need to make it uh, simpler and make it more, more uh, uh, promoting that kind of uh, change. S is for skills and talents. Of course, we need to continuously develop uh, 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 talents for future uh, requirements. Therefore, the, the, the need to work closely with the industry, the university and the struct to determine what are the skill sets that are required in the future. And finally, technology uh, that are, can be uh, developed indigenously in the country or can be done in co-creation with other, other partners. So I think the FIRST is basically that, that baseline to, to look at making sure that everything is there for the ecosystem to, to mature or to be successful. Next slide, please. So again, what we are trying to do in, in, in might is looking at, uh, from the financial perspective, a new funding model, a model that does not uh, rely too much on the uh, government's uh, uh, ability to, 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 to fund things, but also to get uh, uh, different uh, sources of these uh, funding from other stakeholders. So the, the idea of uh, bringing the uh, uh, private sector funding from the crowdfunding and extra is a very important thing. And in Malaysia, we are looking at expanding this fund uh, from 1.0% of our GDP to 2.5%, uh, uh, inshallah. Next is the infrastructure, as I, as I mentioned, the, it is, is a, a new way of looking at it from the physical and virtual uh, perspective. So we're looking at very hybrid and agile uh, workspace as well as uh, living space so that this can actually create uh, uh, attraction and also that uh, ability to work comfortably in, in a new environment. So during pandemic, we tested with work, working from home, for example, and then I think we need to continue even when the pandemic is, is over because it, it brings certain element of productivity and also comfortability for our, our staff. And also to showcase uh, a lot of these, what we call now innovation to zero. When we do things, we're talking about impacting in from a zero carbon uh, perspective, zero waste, uh, zero plastics, and, and et cetera. So these are elements that we need to include in the, in the infrastructure uh, usage or infrastructure uh, development. So I mentioned before, in terms of regulation and policies, uh, mission-oriented innovation policies are very key. So we, are, we have to move that uh, from conventional policies to more agile and adaptive policies uh, with follow-through, of course, uh, in terms of its uh, 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 implementation. Skills and talents, uh, we talk about, of course, new business skills, uh, focusing on digital technology, and then we talk about making uh, technology and vocational Education, a very key element there. And people are looking at metaverse now, looking at alternative universe to create and, and, and you know, using a, a virtual reality and et cetera. So these are some of the things that are, is happening throughout our, our, our uh, development. So from narrow, focus uh, 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 skill sets to a more deep general, generalist kind of uh, uh, ability. And then on, on technology, of course, uh, uh, talking about uh, increasing uh, national resilience and, and self-sufficiency is very key. So we need to move away from just talking about for our concept to implementing and follow through. And I'm sure some of our friends here are th already talking about uh, the fifth industrial revolution and, and the likes. So this will actually bring about the competitiveness and resilience of our stakeholders in the whole uh, ecosystem. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as a conclusion, next slide, please. I think uh, the, the, the model of transformation for our research ecosystem is, 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 is very, very key. Looking at the various uh, challenges that we're going to face, looking at the, the, the new demand uh, of our, our talents and our uh, resources, natural or, or otherwise. I think uh, one is that we, we, we need to really look at the... Uh, uh, model that, that promotes and accommodate innovative, uh, resilient, inclusive, and uh, sustainable uh, systems. And then secondly, that the, the one thing that I, I uh, uh, advocate and promote a lot 
is that partnership between government, uh, private sector, uh, citizens, and the research institute must be uh, very, very uh, uh, close, must be very trusting, uh, must be very uh, 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 mutual, uh, and, and that would actually create a very uh, sustainable and uh, uh, success for the countries and the whole, uh, the whole ecosystem. So with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, uh, to share with you some of our thoughts. Uh, we'll wait for the discussion. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yusuf, uh, for sharing with us challenges, transformation models, the five future defining attributes which can apply across several sectors, and importantly, FIRST implementation framework. We can see a lot of similarity with the BCG concept, which is also focusing on several important issues, including innovation, inclusiveness, and partnerships among all sectors to drive the sustainable development goals. So we can definitely exchange more ideas during the discussion session later on. So thank you again, Dr. Yusuf. And our last speakers, Dr. Lakshmi Krishnan, Vice President of Life Science, National Research Council, NRC, Canada. And currently, Dr. Krishnan also serves as an adjunct professor in the Department of Biochemistry, Microbiology, and Immunology at the University of Ottawa. At NRC, she oversees the human health, therapeutic, aquatic and crop resource development, and medical devices research centers. As a globally recognized life science researcher, Dr. Krishnan has been a leader for driving innovation in the area of novel biologics treatments for the improvement of human health. She has represented NRC at the Government of Canada International Joint Committees. And today she will share with us her idea on the topic of lessons from COVID-19 and innovating for the future at the National Research Council of Canada. So, hello, Dr. Krishnan. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Uh, oh, we can hear you very well. Very good morning to you, and thank you again for being with us very early. We are very grateful for your contribution. So, if you're mm -hmm. ready, the screen yes, is please. yours now. Thank uh, please, you. Will you. Will you share my slides from your end? Sure, we will do that. Do you want me to share it or would you share it? No, no, we will share it for you. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So as the slides are coming on, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting NRC and inviting me to share today uh, through this virtual podium. I actually am speaking to you from uh, Ottawa, Canada, which is on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples. Uh, so we'd like to acknowledge that. And uh, yes, indeed, it's very early in the morning, but I'm glad through this virtual forum we were able to um, share our view for the future and the lessons learned from COVID with you. So if you could move to the next slide. So in my presentation today, I will uh, give you an overview of NRC to situate our organization, the National Research Council, and then talk about how during the time of the pandemic, we did a strategic pivot to meet the needs uh, of Canada and solutions for the pandemic, and uh, then focus more on the strategic pillars going forward, our investments in facilities and talent, and how we think that we can position ourselves effectively for the future. So next slide. So the National Research Council is uh, Canada's largest uh, research science-based organization. Uh, we have three clear mandates. First of all, we advance scientific and technical knowledge. Uh, we support the government policy objectives. And finally, uh, we focus on translational research by supporting business innovation. Next slide. Uh, NRC is actually uh, doing science innovation from coast to coast. We have offices situated all across the cities of Canada from coast to coast, and there are two arms of the NRC. The first is the extramural research funding arm, which is the Industrial Research Assistantship Program, IRAP. 
which delivers national funding program and advisory support to small and medium-sized enterprises in Canada. And secondly, there we have 14 intramural research centers across Canada that conduct research and technical services, uh, both in partnership with clients, but also with other organizations nationally and internationally. Next slide. So as an organization, just a little bit more view in, in terms of how we are set up, we have uh, four, uh, five research divisions which constitute our intramural research arm, and this span many different sectors from transportation, engineering, life sciences that I lead, emerging technologies, as well as digital research. And then, of course, our industrial research assistantship funding program is also present coast to coast, region to region, in order to support different sectors. Next slide. So a little bit more about our industrial research assistance program, because this was something that we have worked with Thailand to uh, also support a similar a setup of a similar program inside your country. Uh, and in this, we provide advice, connecting and funding to our small and medium sized enterprises. And the program currently serves over 8000 clients annually. And we provide the link to the innovative Canadian SMEs to the global value chains in order to help them scale, in order to help them grow and accelerate current technology solutions. And also a big part of this program more recently, particularly during COVID, has been to support employment uh, opportunities. Next slide. Uh, in contrast, our intramural research footprint is really focused sector-wise at different sites, uh, and I won't go through this list, just to indicate to you, we cover many different sectors from plant biotechnologies, agriculture, uh, human health, as well as construction and engineering, aerospace. And they are really positioned to uh, capitalize on the local regional economy, as well as globally and nationally collaborate and bring the ecosystem in Canada together towards translational research in this area in collaboration with universities, but also in collaboration with the industry. Next slide. So to sum up, NRC delivers value to Canada in two ways. One, through our national research center efforts that are performing research and technical services with our partners. And secondly, through the funding program. Next slide. So if you look at the history of NRC, NRC has had a enduring and evolving role through the century. In fact, we are over 100 years old today. And if you look at the various times that NRC has stepped up, one thing that has sustained in terms of the role of NRC is the advice we have given. At the same time, we've been a resilient organization that has positioned itself to the needs of the country and to the international need as the time has evolved. So, for example, in the early 1928s, NRC used to conduct applied and industrial R&D, and that continues to date. But as we progressed, we have also moved on to do some basic science, to do some uh, high risk, high reward uh, type of science while we are also helping the industry. Uh, we have uh, created industry oriented institutes in certain sectors. Uh, we have done regional expansion in certain cases so that it uh, meets the needs of the regional uh, um, community. And then in 2012, we did a major transformation to be a research and technology organization where we really brought together our intramural and extramural research arms together to position ourselves to help industry focused innovation. And in 2016, we did an, uh, yet another renewal through what we termed as a dialogue where we engaged not only NRC internally, but also externally with our stakeholders to identify key sectors and area where we could actually um, embark on mission oriented challenge programs, as we call it, in order to meet goal oriented uh, solutions. Next slide. So a few examples of a century of innovation are in this chart. I won't uh, go through specifically each one of them, but uh, some examples here that are quite uh, worth highlighting is, for example, even as early as the 50s, we would do, we had been the key innovator to create the pacemaker, the electric wheelchair. Uh, we have collaborated with the International Space Agency uh, to actually make the Canada arm that some of you may be very familiar with. Uh, we have done vaccine research, so the first very 
first glycoconjugate vaccine patents came out of the NRC and synthetic, synthetic meningitis vaccine uh, that is now part of infant vaccination in most countries came out of the NRC in the early 90, uh, 1990s. Uh, in the 2000s and beyond, we have done simulated brain surgery innovation, uh, biofuels, um, uh, and so the list goes on. Next slide. So NRC's strategic platform is to find solutions for not only Canada's priorities, but also international needs and priorities so that we can position Canada as a leader in the international uh, ecosystem of R&D and innovation. And we do this through four major uh, goals. Firstly, research and technical talent. Uh, 20, uh, 2,000 plus NRC researchers, scientists uh, are really focusing our experts and skills in order to meet and undertake impactful research. Uh, we operate large technology platforms and this helps us to secure technology platforms for the industry, particularly in areas where uh, it is difficult for industry to maintain large facilities and installations. This includes, for example, aerospace research, research aircrafts, uh, standards. Uh, for example, NRC is a timekeeper for Canada. Uh, our uh, Astronomical Institute looks at telescopes and we collaborate significantly internationally to a few examples. And then innovation based on SMEs, and this is a really a very um, a strong area in terms of the bioeconomy, where we are working with a number of small biotechnology uh, companies to uh, help them innovate and scale. And lastly, as I mentioned, in, uh, in about four or five years ago, we launched the mission-oriented research collaborative programs, which I will speak a little bit later on, in many very key areas, such as uh, clean fluids, uh, AI, quantum aging in place, as well as cell and gene therapy. And this suite of programs and tools we had in place was actually quite useful uh, during the pandemic because these tools allowed NRC to pivot and focus very quickly in support of the COVID-19 pandemic response. And uh, this could also help us now find new solutions in the new goals we've set up for ourselves in the next um, post-pandemic era. Next slide. So COVID-19 strategic pivot that we did is uh, outlined next slide. And we, as soon as the pandemic hit, in fact, I was uh, one of those people that were in February at the WHO blueprint meeting, uh, representing Canada and representing NRC, uh, discussing about how globally we need to position to respond to the pandemic. At the NRC, we divided our objectives into three major goals, protecting our people. And this mean, meant that ensuring that our staff who would be continuing to come in the laboratories to work could do so in a very safe manner. So we put into uh, place very good protocols, support system, health and safety measures, um, as well as monitoring systems to allow our people to continue to work uh, without interruption. And in fact, I'm very proud to say that over the last two years of the pandemic, uh, we have really not had any significant on-site uh, transmission of COVID, and we have maintained a very, very safe environment for our research staff to continue to work in the laboratories and work on high-priority areas such as vaccine and uh, therapeutics research. Uh, second was supporting our clients, and this came in two forms. One is ensuring that any research we were doing for our clients was done in an uninterrupted fashion, uh, but also helping them some key areas, which I will detail in a minute. And then lastly, uh, to protect the health of Canadians, we embarked on some mission-oriented goals. Next slide. So protecting our clients, the way we uh, um, approached this was to support vaccine and therapeutic development. And so our industrial research assistantship program was entrusted with 150 million over three years uh, funding from the government of Canada to support projects of merit, uh, which were too early to qualify for a larger funding from the government or other sources. Uh, but yet very promising in terms of even the pandemic and the post pandemic recovery. So seven vaccine firms were supported through this um, funding, as well as seven firms developing uh, therapeutics against COVID-19. And so uh, as of today, we have an approved support of about 72 million, and this is uh, expected to scale further. 
The second was that we launched Innovative Solutions Canada program. Uh, this program was already in place for us to utilize and pivot. Uh, but what we did was to ask our uh, SME community to respond to challenges posed by COVID-19. And uh, these uh, prototype style uh, solutions that were pro uh, proposed by the industry uh, were then peer reviewed and they were near to market solutions such as diagnostics. Uh, and these were then awarded very uh, rapidly funding in order to move this closer to the uh, to the testing and evaluation. Next slide. The second aspect on protecting the health of Canadians, what we did is that we had this tool of collaborative science uh, programs, what we call a C-STIP programs that was already in place for mission-oriented research. So we launched using this tool, a pandemic response challenge program. And this program immediately organized the both the intramural and extramural research at the NRC, including collaborations with the university under four key themes, digital care and analytics, enabling adaptive responses, as well as rapid detection and diagnosis and therapeutic vaccines and, um, and therapeutics and vaccines. And to date, uh, we have actually done a number of projects in each one of these areas. We've also matched it about with 9.6 million in internal funding for our intramural researchers, as well as 4.9 million in external funding. And the key outputs coming out of this program has been a number of technology licenses that has enabled our companies and others to move forward biomanufacturing platforms, vaccines. Uh, we have a number of publications, of course, coming in, as well as we've been able to assess and um, bring forth certain platform technologies, which are going to be useful, just not for the pandemic, but also the post-pandemic recovery. Next slide. So to sum up the NRC's contribution to the pandemic response, uh, we uh, were able to immediately look at healthcare. Some examples here, for example, within a week, NRC stood up an N95 mass testing, testing center so that we could actually, in the early days of the pandemic, where the production of N95 masks was at critical for Canada, we could actually do some retesting and repurposing of masks as needed uh, for our frontline staff. Uh, we prepared uh, reference standards and testing reagents very rapidly, and this has been provided to over you know 100 plus uh, entities, both nationally and internationally, to be using in COVID-19 research. And then we enabled a number of companies to do vaccine R&D and enabled biomanufacturing. Uh, similarly, we did innovation along with the sterilization, diagnostics, filtration, uh, and finally, in terms of business support, uh, as I mentioned, our IRAP program not only um, uh, supported companies, but we targeted more than 3,000 youth job placements over the last two years period at a time when jobs were really not possible for a number of our other entities. Next slide. So the themes of the going forward strategic plan for NRC um, are I outlined here, and uh, these are uh, some of the key areas in which we want to focus as we go forward from enabling a more sustainable economy, supporting a healthy future, uh, innovating the everyday, creating Canadian wealth and understanding the world. Next slide. So post pandemic, we have adjusted some of these uh, areas or pillars uh, by prioritizing on three key areas. First of all, the pandemic response and building Canada's biomanufacturing capacity, because one of the things we realized was a big gap in our biomanufacturing capacity. We were not uh, having uh, resilience in terms of local production, and we have to have uh, um, relied heavily on actually purchasing and procuring vaccine, which we have done successfully, but going forward, um, should there be another uh, situation or a crisis, we want to have national resiliency. Second is climate action, looking at resiliency in climate action and greening. And lastly, digitalization and quantum as being the disruptive technologies of the future. Next slide. So in the pandemic response building of Canada's biomanufacturing capacity, our focus is twofold. First of all, to continue to play a key role in the pandemic response, because we do not think this is yet over, and uh, advance certain vaccine production technologies to be actually broad platform technologies that can be used not only for the vaccines for today, but also vaccines for the future, um, and build the biomanufacturing resilience, which I'll speak to in a few seconds, and in, engage in future R&D, which is more resilient. So both vaccines and therapeutics in emerging infections area, 
uh, cell and gene therapy for rare diseases and niche applications, which was uh, be not something that the uh, private entities will invest in very rapidly, or if they do, it will not be affordable and accessible. So we want to ensure we bring forth as a government organization affordable and accessible therapies for the future. We also want to invest in technology accelerators and certain disruptive technology areas, such as virtual care uh, and microfluidics as a platform. And of course, strengthen our international and national collaboration uh, to be able to work cease, um, seamlessly with our international partners in key sectors. Next slide. So in climate action, our goal, of course, like many other countries, is to help achieve a net zero emission uh, profile for many of our um, R&D as well as our built environment. Uh, we are also co-leading with other government departments a national battery innovation strategy, and we're developing and building energy codes for climate resiliency. And in the green transformation, we are looking at three areas which we think are going to be extremely important, agriculture, aerospace, and transportation. Uh, these are today areas that actually um, uh, t take a lot of energy consumption. So bringing in innovation in this area, in our view, is going to be critical for the future uh, for climate action. So we are one area, for example, in agriculture, we're looking at climate resilient crops. And this is particularly uh, relevant for us, given the changing uh, warming of the environment in Canada, but also for some of our Canadian northern populations, uh, which need uh, you know, uh, access to uh, nutrients right at their doorstep and not necessarily fully being um, uh, focused on procuring uh, food from other areas. Uh, similarly, we're looking at the low emission aviation program and high efficiency mining program. Again, you can see the theme that we're really trying to green our resource-based economy into a more circular economy. Next slide. In digitalization and quantum, uh, we actually have just launched a new challenge program in quantum, again, using the same tool which, uh, tool, which allows us to very easily collaborate nationally and internationally. And we're looking at applied quantum computing and Internet of Things quantum sensors as our two key areas where we want to bring disruptive innovation. Uh, we are also revitalizing our photonics research center. So a modernized Canadian photon photonics fabrication center is uh, currently being upgraded as, as I speak. And we are advancing AI uh, to detect and avoid solutions for drones, for example, or also use AI for marine applications such as uh, CIs, Freeze Up, Coast Guard. And you do see there's a lot of intersectionality in these with the circular bioeconomy. And so we will also, for example, bring digital twinning to biomanufacturing. Uh, we would do nano-enabled disruptive solution for bioanalytics and common frameworks for systems and units uh, as well through our metrology research center. Next slide. So speaking a little bit of the biomanufacturing resilience, uh, one of the gaps we uh, noticed, as I mentioned, was the lack of in, uh, national biomanufacturing capacity. And what we want to enable is a, a continuous clinical production, material production suite for early stage clinical material production as we have the um, pipeline being uh, strengthened and we have a number of SMEs developing vaccines and therapeutics in Canada. And then we also uh, want to have the production capacity. So on the right side here, you see that we actually built the Biologics Manufacturing Center, which is a two-story Biologics Manufacturing Facility. Um, this was built in a record time, and I'll speak about it in a second. And then right now on the left side, I'm showing that we're also going to be having a target operation in 2024 for a complementary clinical trial manufacturing facility. And these as a not-for-profit government-owned manufacturing facility will be present and available to pivot as rapidly as needed for the emerging needs uh, of the future. Next slide. Uh, so our biologics manufacturing center, which is on our Montreal campus, uh, was built in uh, 10 months time. It is currently undergoing uh, commissioning in order to produce uh, authorized vaccines. Next slide. And the, the main um, um, capacity of the center is that the building itself is a full end-to-end -end manufacturing. It is two individual production suites, which go up to 2,000 liter capacity. Uh, it has its own uh, quality control laboratory as well as fill and finish capacity. Uh, and then, uh, of course, we have a number of the standard biomanufacturing GMP compliant uh, facility uh, infrastructure. 
And then we, uh, we are also now working towards um, uh, doing some engineering runs for authorized vaccines in this facility uh, in the upcoming year. Next slide. The second facility, which is right now under construction on the same campus, um, uh, so it was be actually complementary to a large production site, will be more closer to the R&D unit. We already have a very strong R&D presence on this campus, uh, which is our NRC Human Health Therapeutics Research Center, which is known for the development of vaccines and biologics. Uh, which comes under my leadership and in this uh, clinical trial manufacturing center, we will be able to help small uh, companies bring first in human uh, GMP materials ready for clinical testing. And we expect this to be operational in about 2024. The construction itself will be completed by early 2023. Next slide. So, lastly, I want to sum up and say that the, the, the reason why NRC was able to pivot very quickly during the pandemic and actually bring forth solutions and the reason we think that we are positioned well for the future that we will be able to strengthen is really our collaboration tools. And this come in a number of different tactics we use. First of all, we have collaboration centers that we have uh, placed within uh, uh, Canada, where essentially NRC is present sometimes on the campus of universities or on the campus of our collaborating research institutions. And through this, we already have certain you know, uh, sector specific, uh, both physical as well as virtual collaborations in place that can be pivoting. Uh, we have quite a bit of research on mobility because we are a, a research uh, organization that crisscrosses against engineering and biology and in many different sectors. We can very quickly mobilize our research staff to ask questions. One example of this during COVID was the N95 testing. Our biologists and engineers and uh, uh, our construction people came together to immediately put that prototype test lab together within a week in order to enable that. Thirdly is our challenge program suite. This suite uh, is a, a, a collaboration program suite, which not only has capacity to fund intramural research, but also fund extramural research and international research. And we can have mission oriented programs. We have launched about four or five programs in the suite, uh, as I mentioned in cell and gene therapy, aging in place, oceans. Uh, and now we are looking protein super protein um, uh, production so uh, which to support the uh, agricultural innovation. So these are the areas that we are continually identifying and we launch mission oriented programs in these areas uh, which help us uh, really bring the key minds together and blend that for innovation. And lastly is our IRAP international collaboration. Uh, this introduces innovative Canadian SME that can address technology needs of larger companies and provides funding to Canadian SME for co-innovation projects with foreign companies to develop and adapt Canadian technologies and services. Next slide. And I'll end by saying that we have actually, you know, had a long-standing uh, collaboration with uh, NSTDA. And in fact, uh, this has been ongoing for many years. Uh, NRC, as I mentioned earlier on, assisted Thailand in establishing a mirror program to our IRA program, which I believe you call it as ITAP. Um, and in uh, more recently in 2021, my previous vice president, we are VP of life sciences, Dr. Roman Shumsky, had chaired a virtual roundtable with NSTDA executives, vice president, Dr. Prashith uh, Palita uh, Pungarpin, and other world leading agencies during the funding agency president's meeting uh, on, in September 2021. And we continue to be discussing other opportunities with IRAP in the food industry, uh, as well as with ITAP. Uh, we have had a number of projects in with our energy mining and uh, center, as well as uh, NSTDA is also, we understand, an active member of the uh, uh, research and technology organization International Network, RIN, uh, which is in fact chaired by our NRC president. So there's definitely a lot of opportunity that we see where we can continue to collaborate and benefit from each other's uh, capacities, expertise, leadership, and uh, transformation. So last slide. 
So to, to end, what I would like to say is that NRC, uh, we have a very strong research focus. We have scientists, engineers, over 2000 of them and technicians and other specialty. And this does not include our uh, collaborators that work on our site. So our total, when we include our collaborators that work on our site, we have close to 3,500, 4,000 employees that are on our site, but we have 2,100 intramural researchers ready to work on very uh, challenging uh, programs. Uh, we have more than 175 buildings that we manage across NRC um, and uh, in 22 different locations uh, are with an annual uh, government appropriation and funding of about 1.1 billion. Uh, that includes our industrial research program contribution of greater than 300 million for our SMEs. We're really able to bring and blend intramural and extramural research for a very translational uh, um, way in which we move the innovation needle. And this we cannot do without our collaborators. And in fact, NRC collaborates with over 1500 entities and people around the world. And we have helped about 8000 SMEs because we have enabled collaboration. So I uh, really look forward to having those types of opportunities uh, with NSTDA, but also with other participants uh, that are in this uh, elite forum today as we talk about bioeconomy and circular economy as we move forward. So thank you for the opportunity and I look forward to the discussion period. Thank you very much, Dr. Krishnan. Um, due to another engagement of Dr. Lily to be NASDA representative at the site event, of the United Nations Commission on Science and Technology for Development. Dr. Lily must transfer moderator go back to me before time. Please accept Dr. Lily excuse. Um, back to our session. From Dr. Krishnan talk, we have learned that the research institute should be one of the main pillar for evolution of both industry and society, especially when there was a crisis like the, like the COVID-19 pandemic. Your talk emphasized on how important it is for the research institute to build capacity and to be prepared for the next challenges. Thank you. Very, uh, very interesting indeed. So thank you very much, Dr. Krishnan. Um, participants. Um, after hearing all the great presentation of our seasoned leaders, sharing experience and perspective in the transformation of their organization. Now, with great pleasure, I would like to open the floor for discussion. But before I pass the stage to Professor Prasit Palitapon Ganpim, who will serve as the moderator of this forum, allow me to briefly introduce you to Professor Prasit, the Executive Vice President of NASDA. He is current and former executive board member of several public health organizations, including Thailand Center for Excellence of Life Science, the National Vaccine Institute, and the Health System Research Institute. Professor Prasit also served as a temporary advisor to WFHO on many occasions. Professor Prasit, the floor is yours. You know, good, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, I have listened to the, 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 the talk of the four great speakers, and it's very interesting and very inspiring, uh, addressing several problems uh, from biodiversity to COVID-19 and, and so on. Uh, we have a number of outstanding panelists uh, actually the audience that that uh, can join the discussion in in this panel uh, so I think it is the time that we may uh, start some of the discussion uh, at first I I may start with the question if any in the chat uh, there's no question so actually, uh, the talk is really clear. The talk is really clear and really, 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 really uh, inspiring for, for people who, who listen. I'm not sure whether anyone would like to join that talk or share that talk with the panel or the, or the speaker or any speaker would like to add some materials or add some thought to, to, 
to the discussion uh, phase. If if uh, uh, there's still no question, <laughs> I may start with with some some uh, interesting term uh, that that is uh, ecological civilization. Uh, I'm, I'm quite this is really really nice term indeed, very nice term indeed. Uh, I, I I am not quite sure that. Uh, can Professor Chang uh, elaborate a little bit on, on the concept of what, what do you mean by the ecological civilization, please? Uh, uh, I think the, 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 the current challenge is, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 with the, uh, as I mentioned, with the uh, growth of the human population as end of the as, uh, industry and the cities and uh, uh, the human uh, the, 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 the human uh, impact on uh, on a natural habitat uh, uh, is uh, uh, growing too fast and uh, uh, and uh, uh, we uh, so uh, we uh, we need to find the uh, as the solution, uh, how to uh, um, balance the the need of the development and the the, the con uh, and the uh, 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 conservation of the the, the net, natural habitat, the natural resource for for the the the, the, the uh, uh, and the, for the uh, future generation. Uh, so. Uh, 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 so so the. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the the idea is to uh, uh, to keep the uh, uh, to to, uh, to to keep the balance, uh, and uh, that's uh, 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 that's uh, fit very well with our traditional philosophy, uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, and also uh, it's. Um, uh, uh, it's also the, the, the uh, uh, and also we uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, it's it's crucial for the current development state of uh, uh, of China uh, for the sustainable uh, to find the, uh, the way of the uh, sustainable development. Uh, so uh, with this. Uh, 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 Philosophy and the, the the idea, the government implement some the the uh, the the uh, uh, the measurements and the, the guideline and uh, uh, to to uh, to uh, to have more uh, investments uh, on the protection of uh, uh, of our nature uh, and uh, and also uh, encourage. And also encouragement uh, to develop the technologies, and also uh, 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 the improvement with the technologies uh, uh, to to achieve such goals. So, so this uh, uh, this uh, uh, this have uh, uh, so uh, uh, so uh, this this have a great uh, impact on the uh, on the. Uh, 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 the way the government, the local government, deal with the Europe and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, sustainable uh, the uh, the growth of the economy and the and the sustainable of the uh, development and uh, uh, the, the investment on the uh, 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 on post. Uh, on uh, the conservation from the post government and the privatization have been growing uh, very much. Uh, so, so, uh, so I think that this uh, uh, very important uh, 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 lead to the important change of the, the way of the uh, of the development in China. Oh, thank, thank you very much.
I'm not sure whether uh, any other speaker would like to join this discussion as well. Professor Prasit, I have a question to Dr. Shua. Sure. Oh, Since yes, you, <laughs> you mentioned about uh, transform the invention to innovation, and you mentioned two things, that is the basic research and a research on uh, system. Could you elaborate a bit on the research on system? Is it, what does it mean? Does it mean the regulation, investment, law, media, and the type of thing or other thing? Please. Uh, thanks very much for that question, because uh, obviously what we aim for are systemic approaches. Um, so systemic approaches which are sustainable in a wider uh, thing than just a kind of local response, a local solution for a specific topic. And therefore, systemic approaches include um, the research on, on a wider scale, including society, including industry, including regulation, including politics and how to implement things on a better, very wide scale, <clears throat> which provide a kind of background how to uh, how individual solutions which we work on in on a specific industry aspect how they would build into our overall perspective and the importance of the systemic solutions at the same time is to give a direction to which the individual solutions should actually lead uh, because we can easily produce solutions for a certain question which an industry has which overall leads into a non-sustainable direction so taking an example from our our own activities here in, in Germany some years ago, we had the first generation biofuel aspects and that, that definitely was not a sustainable uh, production of bioenergy. So it was a solution to an immediate problem, but it was not going into a sustainable direction. So these the systemic approaches give direction and the individual solutions need to be part of that in order to uh, in, in leading into the direction which the systemic perspective uh, indicates. Since it is include a lot of things, so that means that we cannot do by, by the RTO itself, by the research uh, technology organization itself. We need to partner right. with other organizations in order to do that. Yeah, right. And so a lot of the, of the systemic approaches, as well as the individual approaches, is more kind of dialogue between science and, the, and society, science and politicians, science and industry. Uh, because uh, we often take up ideas which are there from, from reality. So in science, we often have our kind of um, 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 ivory tower approach, uh, which we definitely have to, have, to get, to have to overcome in order to make things happen. Um, and therefore, we, have, we do a lot of dialogue with the society, with industry, with politicians um, to also not only communicate what we learned in science, but also to take up ideas and opportunities and challenges which are there uh, from, from other stakeholders. And when I heard from you, I'm thinking of Mike, because uh, his uh, authority is similar to what we talk, right? Because they're doing about the strategic advisory to the government and industry, as well as uh, nature and invest in technology company as well. Would you like to join us, uh, 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 Dr. Suraiman? The question, uh, Dr. Narong, I, I just said the, the earlier part, sorry. You're talking about the uh, advisory to government and industry. And then your next question was, sorry. Because we'll be talking about research on system in order to transform the in invention to innovation. That was the thought of uh, Professor Chua. And it's, he mentioned a lot of things, including law regulation, talking with the politician, things like that. I think it's similar to, to what you do at MIT. So might yes. might be share with us a bit on, on this thing that how, how how are you doing in, 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 in Malaysia in this topic? Right. I think the the, the idea of uh, getting the uh, inputs and the uh, uh, suggestions by, by different stakeholders is very, very key. So that one is that we, we could actually aggregate all these thoughts and make it into one uh, positive direction, but also to make sure that during implementation, these are the same people that's going to make sure that it's going to get implemented. Now, uh, one of the things that we are working recently uh, on is that 
by having this policy uh, uh, intervention, uh, by having certain strategies on uh, areas of uh, interest, uh, we look at these, uh, uh, the funding mechanism uh, to support that. And we find that uh, when we include the financial institutions from the start of our discussion, yeah, the, 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 the uh, encouragement for them to invest in those projects actually happen naturally. So we, we do not wait until the end that we actually bring different stakeholders to the, the discussion to the table, but we can actually excite them when we actually involve them from, from the start. Now, these conversations have to be very open, have to be very uh, uh, frank, have to be very uh, uh, civilized, uh, so that we can get as, as uh, you know, cover as much uh, angle perspective as, as possible. But finally, we have to agree uh, together on a certain narrative that we can follow for the benefit of the country, and then hopefully that it will also benefit the other stakeholders as we implement the, 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 that particular uh, strategy. So to us, that conversation is, is very, very key, uh, Dr. Narong, and, and, and to have this uh, continuously uh, because of, you, we mentioned just now, the rapid changes that's happening around us, we need to have this conversation more often than before so to keep ourselves updated. I hope I answered that question. Yeah, thank you very much. So thank, thank you very much. Uh, there, there's a question for, uh, which is quite important. Uh, in in the box, uh, the question is: uh, COVID nineteen show that government uh, show that governments and economies can change in short time. Uh, in your opinion, what is the what is a realistic timeline to come to an bio sustainable circular economy? Uh, especially in the light of climate change. Uh, I understand that the question is how, how, how much time do are left for us to change? <laughs> if you want, I can take a first go on that. Um, so I think this is a, a very important question because obviously we are doing this transformation uh, on for the sake of saving the climate, uh, saving the opportunity for mankind to to stay in that on that planet uh, in a way how we are used to it, uh, which means being comfortable and also being being uh, in a sustainable way, and it's on, in our own own interest um, to also safeguard the environment and stewardship to natural resources. So. Um, I think there's one element which is definitely there with respect to the politi politics, um, which, uh, which is specifically mentioned here about governments uh, and how governments can do that. Um, there is a lot of uh, interest and in move in that direction at the moment. I think especially the last, I would say, three to four years, there was a lot of developments in there. Another element which I found, which I find extremely interesting at the moment, because we are we're working quite a bit uh, with that sector as well, is that the financial sector becomes interesting. The financial sector becomes interested in in investing in in real world sustainability. And if you have large pension funds um, which own a lot of money and invest a lot of uh, of, of money into sustainability or have the opportunity to put it in sustainability. If they turn up and say, we would like to invest in real world sustainability, this is a lot of uh, momentum for change, which will probably be even more quick than governments are because governments and politics are diffuse and investors are strict, uh, straight. And there's a lot of development, which I see there at the moment. Uh, and I would see a lot of momentum coming from that direction. Um, which in the past they definitely did a lot of bad things, but today this is could be a, a real wind of change into the positive direction. Would be interesting to see how other part other panelists here would do see this from their uh, perspective in their countries. That uh, that's the observation which I have in Europe on a European scale. Yeah, I, I would second that. So I think what we are seeing is it's not a matter of, you know, how, how quickly we can go there. It's I think now there's consensus that we have to take action today. 
And that drive is coming from the society and it's coming from the private investors. So we see that in Canada too. So it's it's not a matter of the government bureaucracy or the government policies uh, uh, taking its time to pivot, but this is the demand that is there. So then that I think allows for a more uh, you know intentional conversation among the various sector players. And that then allows to identify where we want to go. And the other thing we see now is uh, is more and more that there is a appetite to do some things which are a bit more high risk. So uh, even though this innovation could be high risk, but because it will have the bigger societal impact that will happen if in fact we are able to capitalize and you know, benefit from that high risk and if it turns out the way we anticipate, so then there's appetite for that risk is also a little bit more higher, I find now. So this is why I think even the investors are willing to, you know, uh, push in that direction uh, so that, you know, the concepts that were, you know, very prevalent maybe some time ago about what's the return on investment, which in some ways maybe closed our vision to a very short, what can I do in the next two years, three years time frame is now looking at a much larger time frame. So to give an example, even our, you know, uh, the uh, collaboration programs that we launched uh, about a few years ago, we started off by thinking we should do seven year programs to allow for some sustenance. But now even just three years into the cycle, we are having a lot of our stakeholders saying, why are you saying seven years? Why don't you look at this in a cycl cyclic format for 10, 15 years? And that doesn't mean that you don't have any actions coming for 15 years, but that you are ready to invest for the long haul, that you're going in for that longer 15 year cycle with definitely milestones along the way, but that you are committing to this road and this innovation for the longer way. And I think this is, you know, fairly new thinking that is coming in uh, in translational research. Because, you know, we always thought it's only the blue sky discovery research that needs to look for the future. But now we're starting to see this evolution in thinking and policy that even translation research needs to have, you know, quite a bit of a runaway to get there and to actually have the realization of benefits, uh, which I think we find is a very good thing, in fact, to blend uh, discovery to translation and to, you know, take some uh, very intentional risks along the way which I think will help us reach there earlier than later in many ways. So yeah, Prasit, can I add a bit to the uh, yes, two earlier views? Uh, one is that sometimes we look at some of these uh, issues uh, and the solution as an, still a choice, an option. And I think as far as uh, environmental uh, uh, sustainability is concerned, it's no longer a choice, no longer an option. We have to do it. But sometimes as though we put it forward, as though we have the time, we have the luxury of, uh, you know, still thinking about it and don't do things now. I, I mean, yesterday I was talking about the waste management and I, I told the cities that it's no longer an option. You have to deal with waste before it becomes too big and become too expensive for you to do anything. So that urgency and that uh, 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 when we, we actually... Uh, you know, uh, introduce this kind of strategy, and we have to make sure that it's no longer an option. We have to do it now. And secondly, I think with regard to the timeline of things, uh, we shouldn't uh, uh, leave out this um, approach of co-creation. Instead of the research institutions and the industry and everybody work alone, work in silos, it is faster and it's more effective to co-create things together so that we can look at it from the uh, researcher's perspective, we can look at it from the market perspective, we can look at the implementation perspective. I think the word co-creation has to be very big here in our research ecosystem, bring everybody from the start and, and look at those things uh, uh, you know, in an uh, uh, acceptable consensus, consensus way. I think that will bring the speed of things much faster. In a way. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I see I, Professor I Yeah, yeah just, uh, I think that uh, 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 for, for China, since we have a, a strong leadership, so the government uh, uh, decision uh, have a, a very uh, uh, a key impact, and uh, uh, and uh, 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 with uh, 
with uh, with the decision, uh, the, the our central government uh, have implemented some very important uh, policy uh, to uh, to to uh, 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 not only for the uh, different local governments uh, to change the way of the the different local governments and the, the way of the uh, of the, the, the growth of the economy uh, and, and and also uh, uh, that's where, uh, that's also uh, have a very important impact on the the, the behavior of the industry and the investment and so so that's will lead to a uh, 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 systematic change uh, 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 and uh, have a, a, a strong uh, 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 that's uh, 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 have a strong uh, 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 impact on in, in many ways uh, that's where we, as, uh, which uh, 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 which would lead to a, a, a better a coordinate the efforts from the uh, from the central government, local government, and uh, and the industry, and uh, and uh, and uh, and the investment, and also the individual uh, behavior of the individuals. Uh, so so that's uh, I, I, I think this uh, very uh, 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 effective in China and uh, and. Uh, uh, we'll have uh, 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 so far uh, that's uh, that's already lead to a significant uh, change. Okay, thank thank you very much. I I, I have a, a question for Dr. Krishnan. Yes, just for curiosity, uh, I have the feeling that with the climate change. Actually, Canada get better. At least, it's not so cold. <laughs> uh, or, or the agriculture may be a little bit better. I, I, I'm not quite sure. There are any uh, fraction of society that are not so care about the climate change. But in general, Canadians are, are, are really good people. So, yeah, yeah. So, so let me say that one thing Canada, Canadians we all like very much to is discuss about the weather, because we say if we cannot discuss the weather, then what would we discuss about? Because this is a <laughs> standard what we discuss about. So, <laughs> but so that, that's that's <laughs> jokes apart. Yes, you know what I do. What I think though is it's the other way around. There's a great recognition that the effects of climate change will be felt faster and quicker on our society than, than any other society. And this has immense issues for a number of areas. I mean, of course, the immediate living, yeah, you might, if we had a bit longer summer, some areas may be happy, but not really, because it's going to bring more flooding, it's going to bring, you know, droughts, so our crops, uh, it's going to bring a number of other things. But more bigger issues is our biodiversity. There's a big concern that our biodiversity could change very rapidly if the climate changes rapidly. Uh, we are seeing, for example, you know, the Arctic uh, mass melt that is happening so fast. And, you know, even though at one end we can say that, you know, Arctic routes can open up for transportation corridors. But the, the flip side of it is that it could very dramatically change our biodiversity, which can have impact on many different things that can be going on uh, in our society. So uh, over and all, I would say Canada is really very concerned and we want to look at. So one of the things, for example, in agriculture that we're looking at is climate resilient crops. Right. So what do we do if our you know, prairies become more drought and we don't have enough rainfall in the summer and we don't have too cold winters? This would really affect entire and we're a resource based economy. So that's going to affect us tremendously. So, you know, that is like one aspect of uh, things that we are looking at. Uh, the same things in terms of, you know, the Arctic research is now very uh, prominent for us because there it's just not just the environment. It's also the lives of our people that live there who, as it is, are facing a lot of issues because their lifestyle has changed so rapidly. 
right? These are populations for generations have lived in a very different lifestyle. And if the environment changes so rapidly, we are imposing on them a lifestyle change that they have not had time to evolve or adapt with. And that brings a number of other issues. So, so there's, a, there's really in every front, I would say that climate change is, is immediate issues for Canada. And overall, I would say the, the Canadians are very concerned about it. And in fact, are demanding action today. And I think I like what Mike said, that it's not a matter of choice. We need to take action today because, you know, uh, urbanization and putting all our people into the cities all, all quickly and rapidly has its own problems. So we have to, you know, immediately, uh, you know, and it's also, I don't think it's going away. So it's not like we can take action today and forget about it for the next 10 years. So I think it has to become part of our lifestyle in every aspect of what we do from research and innovation to you know, society, to behaviors, to uh, policies, to, uh, to investments. So I think that's the way we are looking at you know, the climate action plan, which you will see is a recurring theme in every one of our industry, in every one of our you know, uh, policies. Uh, it's, it's just that front and center. It's part of what we do. Hello, Dr. Prasid, can I ask Professor, a question? Professor, you, you, uh, please. Right, uh, I was looking for a uh, you know, place where I can just pose the question, but uh, I, I could not find it. So maybe I can ask the panel you know, uh, you know, uh, directly here. Uh, when I heard uh, Dr. Lakshmi's talk about technology platforms, this really, you know, uh, raises a question for me about technology platforms, which can be employed, uh, especially for sustainable and resilient societies. Can new technology platforms be uh, uh, geared towards more sustainability rather than to industrial growth? I know that there is some direction, you know, move, movement towards that direction, but it seems to be very slow. So what I want to ask the panel, can sustainability be a profit motive for companies and not just the terrain for government and the public sector? Can we have technology platforms for sustainability? Thank you very much. Um, not sure. I, I probably Professor could start, start with something, but... Um, um, Obviously, that because it's linked somehow to what I what I said before, also on the financial sector, um, I think we we are moving in a situation where the sheer um, stakeholder value um, for for on the on the on the on the um, um, on the cash side is not the only thing which is driving things anymore because um, there's a much wider also sustainability um, realization, even if you think from a pure, say, capitalist perspective, uh, you are destroying your markets, you're destroying your uh, resources, uh, even that would already lead into a more sustainable, more, more consideration of sustainability. Not saying that this is um, the case all over, but we see a lot of um, um, rejuvenally, uh, rejuvenizing things here also on on especially mid caps and, and smaller companies where there's a lot of responsibility with the uh, entrepreneurs on the on the markets and on the on sustainability uh, a very interesting development which i see in many cases not only in the bioeconomy but far beyond also in mobility and things like that there's a lot of um, startups and young people forming new companies, which are very more interested in sustainability than in making money. Uh, there's much, there's a the whole sector which is looking into how can we build sustainability, uh, obviously on the basis of you have to earn some money because you have to run your business, but the main target is sustainability. So I see a lot of opportunities there, especially with, with young guys, with young people coming into the on the play. It's just a kind of first hint, probably in that direction, uh, which you asked for. Yeah. So to add to it, I would say that uh, what we have observed is that the the societal impact and the motivators is very different now for entrepreneurs than the past. 
Uh, I'll give you an example, even with, uh, with you know, we build the biologics manufacturing center uh, very, very rapidly. And it's going to be a publicly owned center, research center, making vaccines and uh, products. And biomanufacturing is an area where, you know, there is a lot of ta talent gap. We can't find people because there's so many opportunities. So we thought as we were putting together, we had to hire 100 people. How are we going to do it? Compete in the global, you know, talent pool to actually attract people. We were actually surprised. It was not the motivation of salary that they wanted to come, but it's the motivation of the public good that they wanted to actually work in an organization like that. And I see that the same theme is occurring in entrepreneurs as well, where it's not the bottom line of the profit. Yes, it's still capitalistic. You have to be sustaining. But if there are policies to support it, then there is motivation to actually be part of that journey. So I think it is there has to be the link between policy setting and government prioritization and you know allowing entrepreneurs to take some risks and de-risking that uh, so for example in the greening area we have a program that uh, all our federal um, buildings uh, if we are doing any even 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 though we are r d units and if we are doing any facility expansions we cannot do a facility expansion or a capital build without first looking at greening so, you know, that is like front and center of what we need to do. So this really then drives the people in the in the construction industry to be able to adopt and take those, you know, technologies even today, even though the cost may be higher, because they know that there is a procurer at the end of the day, the government, which is going to procure it and actually implement it. So, yes, the early investments is going to be much higher, but having those type of policies up front and central, I think allows the people that are uh, developing uh, sustainable technologies to bring it to the forefront and to validate it. And then when you combine that with the societal and uh, uh, demands, then I think you really come in a circular way to ensure that you integrate what you're doing as part of it. And then this will also reduce cost drivers in the future, right? Because as more and more people adopt these technologies, the cost will go down. So it's really allowing the pathway for the initial adoption of these technologies and showing the path. And I feel that's where the government has a big role to play because the government can take that role and can you know de-risk that for the longer term. Thank you for your answer. Uh, Professor Jung Yu was uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Science and Technology of Thailand. Thank you very much for joining uh, this meeting. I'm not sure whether you have any other question, Professor Yong Yut. Oh, I, I think that the the, the two uh, comments that, that were given just now, I think uh, are really very helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Professor Prasit. Mr. Chairman. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Dr. Chadamad, please. Yes. Dr. Chadamad is the Vice President of NASA. Yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, may I ask uh, uh, Professor Chur uh, or maybe some others uh, as well? Uh, I heard some keywords uh, from uh, Professor Chur. Uh, for example, the social innovation. It's social innovation in order to bring science and research uh, to realize the outcome and impact. And uh, earlier we talked about the systematic approach and also we talked about the translational research. I wonder if uh, this has any implication on the employee portfolio of your, uh, as a research organization like um, uh, previously you are maybe uh, science uh, and engineering uh, as the majority of the employee. Now we are like, I don't know whether you see more of the non-scientists or social scientists into the portfolio of the organization or you have these people by working with other uh, organization instead of recruiting as your employees. Yeah, thanks very much for that question. Yes, I think we definitely need to have a number of changes there in order to have this more inter more more interlinked um, activities between science and other stakeholders. On the one hand, 
Um, recruitment, yes, we see that. We have uh, many more people now who are at the interface between uh, it, on the, in the science, still employed in the science background, but who are more in the communication dialogue uh, business with stakeholders. Uh, there's much more discussion there. We also have specific um, social uh, science people involved, which are um, which are looking in transformation pathways. So, for example, I mentioned one one uh, project in the talk, which is uh, transform to bio. This is social sciences. This is how do we generate momentum from also the, the, the society at large into a sustainable um, willingness to, for sustainable development? Because, because this also involves individuals to act. Um, we probably will have to pay more for certain products because they are sustainable and not only based on the sheer simple how much money do we have to pay at the, at the cashier. I think that's a, that's a thing which we, we are strongly working on because it's also clear we can the consumption, the consumer and the consumption is a very important part of the whole transformation pathway. Um, we cannot just uh, say we will replace fossil carbon by bio-based carbon. That will not work. We need to think more detailed about the, about the consumption. And this is, goes back to individual people. So this is part of the entire process. That's also part of of, of the experience which we have with this regional approach that we can reach people much more specifically, much more directly, uh, and uh, really come up with a wide, much wider approach. Beyond that, um, probably one, one final comment on that, it's also putting additional um, efforts on scientists. Um, so scientists need to communicate more. They not only communicate to their own community anymore, but they need to also be willing and enabled to communicate to others. And we are looking for more and more into kind of generalist scientist approaches where people can do that. There are still the deep dig digging genius who would you would not put into a communication with the society or the public that's necessary. But you also have to have people who are willing and driven by let's communicate with other stakeholders. Um, and with the public, and we, we have this very often, and uh, we talk a lot with uh, with uh, journalists. Just yesterday, I had a, a group of new of young journalists here. We talk to them, and they ask questions, and they come up with ideas. So there's a lot of lot of interaction going. And dialogue is the key. Thank you. I. Do not see other question. I, I, I have another question. Oh, Dr. Wani, I guess that you will ask something. Dr. Yes. Wani is the director of, of the National Nanotechnology Center. Thank you. Um, Asan Prasit Ka. Um, good afternoon and good morning to all the panelists and speakers. Thank you very much for a very meaningful um, presentation and um, all your valuable experience sharing with us. Um, I have questions. To Dr. Yusuf Sulaiman from MIT. Um, I really like the concept you share with us FIRST implementation framework, um, especially to skill and talent. You mentioned about the shift from narrow and focused to deep generalist. So I would like to learn from you more in terms of um, practical actions or measures how you really work on that. Right. And also another question is about the time, time, um, timeline right. in terms of time. How long would you plan for um, really to achieve what you set for? Two questions, please. Well, well uh, I think that the first part of the question really talks about the need for multidisciplinary uh, approach to a lot of our issues, challenges nowadays. So that, that generally, that means touching on different disciplines is very, very critical. But we also need to be able to deepen our, our knowledge, our understanding of certain things to a certain, certain, certain level. So I think this, this is a very important um, uh, message, especially to policymakers not only to see the surface, but also to be able to look at the uh, deepening of all these uh, uh, sciences, technologies, and, and et cetera. 
So the the the, the individual uh, ability must be able to look at all these things and and be good at uh, uh, specialized in one part, particular area. So I guess that is true for the whole ecosystem, isn't it? We have to open our eyes and see what's happening around us, and different people will contribute uh, differently to the whole uh, ecosystem. So how long how long does it does does it, does it take? To, to get this uh, uh, up and, and running, like, like I, I mentioned, if there is a common uh, agenda, uh, we, we can actually agree on what we want to do, then I think it's, it's much simpler to, to identify who are the experts, who are the key stakeholders that we're going to, to bring uh, together. Now, this, this speed of things is also uh, related to what uh, Professor Yong Yut was asking just now. How do we treat the different players? I think uh, one would be uh, the carrot and stick approach. I think as we deal with uh, 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 you know, environmental, ecological uh, issues, we, not, we, we must actually be able to penalize the businesses, the individuals, the policymakers, who actually uh, you know, come up with things that actually, with unintended consequences, destroy environment or, 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 or these things. So I think uh, if we can get together to understand the impact of all these things, I think we'll be able to implement things uh, very, very fast. I don't have a definite uh, tenure for all this, but I guess if the conversation starts early, we can actually achieve a lot of things uh, very, very fast. I hope I answer your question, Professor. Thank you. Yes, very well. Thank you very much. Uh, we may have time for the last question. Uh, the chairman, this is Julalat. Ah uh, yes, please. Uh, Doctor Julalat is also a vice president of NASDAQ. Thank you. I have uh, two questions. The first question is for Professor Yusof. Uh, I continue my question from uh, Dr. Wani about the FIRST model, and you also mentioned about the GERD, increase of GERD of Malaysia from 1.04% to 2.5%. I would like to know uh, how long does it take for Malaysia to increase this amount of curd and how, 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 to, how, to make it, uh, how to make it work. And my second question is for all uh, speakers. Uh, I have learned uh, from your comprehensive presentation that us uh, in 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 your organization or in your country, you have implement bio economy and or circular economy and or green economy. Uh, but for Thailand, for our government, we believe that these three uh, economy models should be integrated and work along the way out together. Uh, could you share your opinion about our our BCG economy model? Thank you. Well, uh, maybe I quickly answer that, Professor Prasit, the, the, the first question. Professor uh, uh, Suleiman, yes. please. Well, in order for us to go from 1.04 to 2.5, yes, at least hoping the, the oil price uh, uh, goes up and the price of our oil palm actually goes up. Now, it's, it's very, very high, so we are very confident that we can meet that. But the, the contribution is not only from the government, but it's also coming from the industry. So we are, we are trying to encourage the industry to be part of the whole uh, research ecosystem. That's why I said when we have things like co-creation, they become very interested. They are willing to, to put money where, 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 you know, where, where, where is, is needed. Uh, we uh, at MIPE, we study the Global Innovation uh, Index uh, very, very thoroughly. And, and we find that for whatever you invest now, actually the, 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 the index uh, will only change about three or four years uh, later. So to the politician, it's, it's not a very good uh, value proposition because they might not be around anymore and they want to see the result now. So it is sometimes uh, very important to think about how research and development and innovation is actually a long-term phase. You, you will not see the, the result now. So you have to convince somehow the stakeholders that this is for the long-term uh, 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 you know, uh, stay that you're going to do all these uh, 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 research. So 1.0.4 to 2.5 uh, in terms of its uh, quantum is not that difficult for, for us to achieve. 
but in terms of looking at the result of this uh, 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 enlargement of the R&D, maybe, maybe you know, very far in, in the future. So it's always important to remind the politicians, the policymakers, and etc. Please don't look at tomorrow to see the result, but let, rather five or, or you know years or, or so. So I hope I answer that that question, uh, Professor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. And any speaker would like to comment on the Thailand BCG model, please. Yeah, so I, I could probably say something on that. Um, so obviously, circularity in itself is the basis of any sustainable system. That's I think that's the basic. And um, I usually say, um, with respect to bioeconomy, if you would build a bioeconomy which is not circular, this would be a failure. Yeah? Uh, we can easily build a non-circular bioeconomy which um, repeats all the mistakes which we did in the past on fossil. So I think it's extremely important to build that together. And we also heard during that panel that the um, sustainable development and the environment in balance is important. Otherwise, we will not be sustainable as well. So I think the uh, bringing the, the three elements together is essential uh, for, for any way how we move into in the future because otherwise we would repeat the, the mistakes of the past. We've seen that it's not work, not sustainable. If we do it the way we did it, let's do it in a way that it's sustainable. Yeah, uh, I, yeah I, would, I would like to share uh, some of, of my observation in, in China uh, on the sales chain ranking on this aspect. Uh, uh, if, uh, if, uh, uh, with the uh, 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 with the decision of the uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the our leadership and uh, uh, on the like for example the on the of the industrialization and uh, uh, and uh, uh, the, the the government invest more on the on the relevant technology like uh, green green energy and uh, that's one end and on the other end that would change the the, the 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 way people think about their life their life and also the the, 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 uh, uh, and also the change of the industry, and uh, that would uh, uh, create the the consumer and the create the market for for such uh, environmentally friendly uh, uh, technology, and uh, that will. Uh, uh, stimulate the investment on the on the development of technology, and the, which will reduce the, the price and make it uh, uh, you know uh, uh, um, which, uh, which 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 the need of the market and uh, and the, then stimulate more consumers. So that's that's kind of the you know. Uh, 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 where we have ranking, uh, a chain ranking, but that's need some, uh, uh, need some, uh, how to say, the, uh, the, 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 the government pay a uh, uh, very important, uh, 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 uh position to, to stimulate or to become the such reaction. So that's make it happen. Otherwise, you know, the technology, uh, the potential technology is available, but that's not usable. And uh, so that's we uh, need to take action to to uh, to, uh, uh, to make a coordinated effort from from different directions to make a, to to make that uh, change uh, happen and make it becoming. Sustainable. 
take a now in China, uh, the uh, green energy, uh, uh, green energy industry goes very fast. That's create a lot of job opportunity, and the technology become more cheap, cheaper and cheaper. And uh, uh, so that's that's come with the market standard. So it's becoming more sustainable, and uh, that's also changed the uh, changed the gradually changed the energy uh, the the. the Increasing the the use of of the green energy. So 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 I think this uh, very uh, uh, interesting uh, chain ranching and uh, very uh, uh, very very healthy. That's uh, it is uh, it's uh, quite encouraging. That's. Uh, 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 so, uh, this uh, sustainable uh, technology is uh, 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 is very uh, uh, have a very potential to be coming up uh, uh, up late, uh, 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 have a very strong application and create a new industry, new market. Thank you. Uh. Thank you yeah, very much. Might, yeah, if I might uh, add to that, I'd say that we we see it as uh, not independent in any way because uh, there is a lot of intersectionality, particularly with technology drivers, right? So if you have a you know physical input going and driving a biologic a bi, you know bioeconomy, uh, that very one can also have an effect on greening or a new greening way of actually uh, you know utilizing the physical input in a bioeconomy. And this, you know, by adopting this, you're going to create, a, you know, more circular economy of new jobs, more uh, innovative type of jobs, more types of skill training. So I think there's a lot of intersectionality. And from a technology standpoint, as technology innovators, what we look for is platform technologies that actually, you know, really crisscross that intersection. So you can actually have impact in more than one sector at the same time. And this is very true, for example, if you look at quantum that we are now uh, embarking on, uh, you know, as we go to quantum computing, I mean, quantum computing could drive the bioeconomy where you're looking at, you know, new ways of doing something in the bioeconomy, but also the same type of quantum computing could be important for a greening technology. So I think by choosing some types of technology platforms that have intersectionality in these various areas, you naturally drive circular economy. And I think we we really you know view it from that lens uh, as you know uh, platforms being agnostic to the sector, and in that way they are integrators uh, rather than actually thinking of them as separate entities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, the discussion is still really interesting. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. Uh, I, we we have spent uh, you take your time for. For, for a few hours. So may I pass this back? Thank you very much, Kat, of, uh, Professor Prasid. Thank you, our keynote speaker and moderator, for a lively and productive discussion today. Your insights contribute greatly to our collaborative effort to transforming research institute to support sustainable and resilient society in the 21st century. The forum had reached to the end. To officially end the President's Forum 2022, please welcome Dr. Narong Sirirat Waragun again to deliver the closing remarks. Professor Narong Ka. I would like to begin my, by expressing my sincere appreciation to all the keynote speakers, presidents, and leaders of scientific and academic institute for attending this important forum and for your stimulating presentation and discussion. Today's forum has shared some light on us as a research institute on how we can apply science, technologies, and innovation to meet with multiple challenges we are all facing. To name a few, this pandemic, 
climate change, the declaration of biophysical environment. The world is changing. It is important for us to learn to adapt and to turn these challenges into opportunities. Opportunity to save this planet and to build resilient and sustainable society for all of us. What I pick up from our forum today is that we have knowledge about harmony and inclusiveness. One cannot act alone to overcome global challenges. We have to work together. Working together at all levels to strengthen capacity, starting from local communities, expanding to the national level, and connecting to the world by being part of the global supply chain. Collaborating with international partners to share knowledge and STI expertise, and playing and playing an active role in international initiatives to advance sustainability agenda. Therefore, close collaborations among the government, industry, local communities, academia, and international institutions are necessary to make it work. In responding to global challenges, NASA is committed to supporting and learning from our partners in both science and networking across the world. The development of innovation solutions for global sustainable development and moving forward with our national agenda, Biocircular Green Economy, to build resilient and sustainable society for the future. Once again, thank you for your support and participation. We at NASDA look forward to our fruitful collaboration in the year ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Narong, for your comprehensive concluding remarks. On behalf of NASDA, I would like to express my warm appreciation to all distinguished speakers and all participants for your effort and your kind support in making this event a success. Before leaving the meeting, may I ask for your kindness to complete the evaluation show on, the, on your screen. Please note that you will receive an email to download the video recorded and PowerPoint file from the organizer this late evening. Have a good day and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.